everybody. Today we are debating whether or not veganism is morally obligatory, and we are starting right now with our vegan team's opening statement from Brian and Ah. Thanks for being here, and the floor is all yours. Hi, James. Thank you so much for having us. Um, I think we're going to begin by defining veganism. Now, Veganism is most currently defined as a way of life that seeks to exclude all exploitation and cruelty towards animals as far as what's possible and practicable. Um, an older definition of veganism is the doctrine that man should live without exploiting animals altogether. That is the key thing that veganism focuses on the most, the exploitation of other living sentient beings for mere taste pleasure. Um, for all the same reasons that we believe our fellow human beings deserve not to be exploited, vegans believe that our fellow non-human earthlings deserve not to be exploited. And so for the same reasons that one, one would find it morally obligatory to not needlessly enslave, exploit, and murder our fellow human beings, we believe that it is morally obligatory to not needlessly enslave, exploit, and murder cows, pigs, and chickens. Um, now, that's not to say that cows, pigs, and chickens are the same as human beings, just as, say, children are not the same as adults, uh, men are not the same as women, and dogs are not the same as pigs. But in all the ways that matter for moral consideration, we are the same. Just like human beings, um, all mammals, all birds are sentient. That means they have a subjective experience of life. The reason we care about sentience is because in order to experience joy or pain, one must be sentient. Now, rocks are not sentient. Yes, clearly. And uh, to the best of our knowledge, plants are not sentient either, but we know for a fact, according to the Cambridge Declaration on Consciousness in 2012, that animals, the, the animals that human beings routinely consume, they are sentient. And veganism is, it's not a diet, it's not a weight loss program. Uh, it's also not a competition to see who can like reduce the most harm or who can increase the most well-being. Um, obviously, the ultimate way to reduce all harm and increase all well-being would be to not exist, which is not a very practical message to spread when you're talking about veganism. Um, veganism, as Anna said, it's about not exploiting fellow living beings, just as we do not exploit our fellow human beings. And uh, to discriminate based on species, which is what many people do, um, that's no different than discriminating based on race or gender or any other morally irrelevant trait that sentient beings happen to possess. Um, you know, pigs, cows, and chickens, they didn't ask to be born pigs, cows, and chickens. That's just a trait that they possess, their species. So if one actively discriminates based on species, then in order to be consistent, one would have to believe that it's also morally permissible to discriminate based on gender, for example. So basically to summarize, you know, for all the right, for all the same reasons that someone would consider it morally obligatory to not enslave, exploit, or kill our fellow homo sapiens, that is why vegans believe it is morally obligatory to not enslave, exploit, or kill our fellow non-humans. Thank you very much. We will kick it over to our omnivore team and want to let you know, folks, at Modern Day Debate, we are a neutral platform hosting debates on science, religion, and politics and want to let you know no matter what walk of life you come from, no matter what your position is on all of the big questions that we debate here, we hope you feel welcome. We're glad you're here. And like I said, we'll kick it over to our Omnivore team. Thanks so much, Professor. And Philip, the floor is all yours. Great. Thank you, James. Uh, I would like to go first if that's okay with Professor. Sure thing. Awesome. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you for having me, James, and thank you to Professor as well as Anna and Brian for talking with me. I am a vegetarian, so hopefully I can bridge the two views a bit. From the vegan side, I am convinced that non-human animals deserve ethical consideration. Therefore, I see factory farming as an issue that needs to be completely eradicated. From the meat eater perspective, I am convinced that veganism's theory of accountability has never been fully substantiated. Vegans claim that veganism is morally obligatory because consumers are accountable for an industry's actions. One of the elements to being accountable for harm is that the harm needs to be properly attributable to the individual. If I throw a rock down a mountain and it hits someone, you can rationally attribute that harm to my action. 
However, I am unconvinced that all of the harm done in industries is properly attributable to the consumer. The law of supply and demand states that consumers provide demand for product X, X, not demand for all actions that an industry performs. X in a given market under given circumstances is what is intrinsic and necessary to procure. For example, in a market for avocados, what is intrinsic to procuring avocados is that the supplier must know what an avocado is, where it is located, and must physically obtain the item in order, in order to sell it. These actions or properties are necessary in that given market and are entailed in the procurement of X. If there is a demand for an avocado and a supplier finds it, picks it up, transports it, then stabs someone on the street, we can say that stabbing someone on the street was not intrinsic or necessary to procure avocados. Therefore, I am unconvinced the consumer bears accountability for the stabbing. However, the supplier bears full responsibility. This is the same with dairy and eggs. To procure dairy and eggs, harm is not necessary or intrinsic to do so, as it is possible to procure dairy and eggs without harming animals. Therefore, accountability falls on the supplier for the harm, and I'm unconvinced it falls onto the consumer. I am convinced that providing demand for items such as meat and leather is immoral because the consumer bears accountability. In these circumstances, dealing with live animals as we know them today, in order to procure meat from them, it is intrinsic to harm them. If I am put in a locked room with a cow and told to procure its meat immediately, it is impossible for me not to harm it. Therefore, consumers do bear culpability. Imagine that James is in a town square, placing $1,000 on a table and states that anybody who brings him a yellow shirt will get the money. The first man buys the shirt from a nearby store to sell back to James. A second man starts stitching a yellow shirt to sell to James. A third man goes to a home, kills all of its residents, and, and robs them of a yellow shirt. I don't see a reason to blame James for the actions of the third man simply by providing demand for a yellow shirt because harm was not intrinsic in procuring a yellow shirt. However, <clears throat> sorry, if James went to a town square and declared he is willing to pay $1,000 for the eyeball of Kim Kardashian, I do see a reason to blame James if the supplier supp satisfies his demand because, in present circumstances, taking the eyeball of Kim Kardashian entails a necessary harm. I don't know whether or not it is morally permissible to buy dairy, eggs, a t-shirt, or a new laptop, but I act in the hopes that it is, just as I act in the hopes that the sun will come up tomorrow, even if I don't know for sure. It seems to me that there is a jump between the harm done and the responsibility of the consumer. If you were to say to me that because I played video games, some dude in Australia beat his family, therefore I am accountable for that, I would be unconvinced and I would need to see how the harm is properly attributable to my act of playing video games. Similarly, I don't see how putting male chicks in a blender is properly attributable to my demand for someone to pick up an egg from a chicken and send it to me. I don't see how branding and stopping on calves is properly attributable to my demand for someone to take the udders of a pregnant cow to milk it and send it to me. Vegans face inconsistency by claiming consumers are accountable for all harm in an industry. If a vegan does bodybuilding as a hobby and consumes a large number of calories, veganism will state that he is morally obligated to abstain from bodybuilding in order to reduce his crop deaths, even though crop deaths are not intrinsic to satisfy his personal demand. Vegans must also only buy foods from fields that minim minimize pesticide use, and they must abstain from buying new clothing because of harm in cotton fields and sweatshops. For a new laptop, vegans are accountable for the har animals harmed in clearing excavation sites and the harm done from 18-wheel trucks that run over animals in transport. Vegans also have to minimize their impact on global warming from electricity and vehicle use. If the vegan purchases anything from companies in which wages are paid to non-vegans who use their wages to purchase meat, the vegan is now accountable for contributions to factory farming. If a vegan buys a movie ticket, they are now accountable for all the exploitative practices engaged in Hollywood. Their reasoning leads to, if you're not minimalist, you're not vegan. If vegans want to claim I am supporting animal suffering, then by their own reasoning, they better grab a paddle because we're on the same boat. I would agree that eliminating factory farming is a collective obligation, just as it is a collective obligation to eliminate homelessness and establish world peace. However, I would not blame anyone for not donating to homeless shelters. Does that mean we as individuals can make small incremental changes as we see fit to reach a collective goal? Yes, and I would be in strong favor of that being morally obligatory. However, I remain unconvinced that the line is drawn at veganism. Thank you. Thanks so much. We'll kick it over to Professor. All right. Um, so I guess my stance is, uh, you know, I'm, a, I'm an omnivore. I guess my stance is that ultimately um, all morality is subjective. There's really only one constraint on morality, and that is social contract. 
Uh, when it comes to exploiting animals, everyone draws a line somewhere and sort of arbitrarily based on their personal preferences. I think uh, you guys are great examples of that. Um, uh, you guys, uh, Brandon and Anna, you take a very hard line on uh, animal exploitation. Essentially, I think you believe it's essentially immoral unless uh, it's absolutely necessary. Others like Phil uh, are okay with being vegetarians. And uh, some vegans think it's fine to have leather or, or kill other animals for personal property rights. Um, my view is that all of these moral systems are essentially equivalently good and bad. There, there's no way to rank moral codes because morality is is, is subjective. Um, I think that that said, many vegans often debate this as though they are they are moral objectivists, as though either they assume that we we share the same values or they simply believe that the morality is superior to ours. I think because they'd like to claim moral superiority and essentially compare that compel their morality on us. Again, I think the only the only constraint on morality is social contract and that otherwise any given person's particular preferences on morality are going to be um, uh, based on their nature, nature and nurture, basically their, their history. Um, the other thing I would say is that you know many of the uh, vegan arguments I've heard are based on an axiom called minimize, essentially to minimize suffering. And I guess what I'd like to uh, point out, and hopefully we can talk about this later, is I think that, first of all, this axiom is not required to define a moral, a moral system. Uh, secondly, I think you can come up with a bunch of uh, really wacky scenarios if you if you if you take this down to its conclusion. I think um, Brian hinted at this idea of uh, you know, the kill all humans button, you might be morally compelled to do that because that is the, you know, the state of absolute minimal suffering, zero. And anyone who, who I think takes a step back and thinks about this for a moment thinks that, they realize that if your moral system, if, if, if clinging to this idea of, um, you know, minimizing suffering is absolutely what you care about and something you're going to navigate all moral quandaries with, um, you know, it's sort of crazy if that also means that you should have to, you're, you're morally compelled to, to hit the kill all humans button. Um, other kinds of, of ways of defining morality around maximizing well-being, you know, again, subjective. You can use it if you want. You don't have to. Uh, I think uh, it can lead to wacky scenarios as well. It can even lead to omniversum, if, if, depending on how you do the calculation. I think all moral codes are essentially ad hoc. They're they're the result of history and and cultural, uh, individual and cultural evolution, and that basically what we call good and bad individually are just a result of our cultural conditioning, where we where we were raised, by whom, and the natural instincts that were bred into us. Um, so basically, I would say that. It's pretty obvious to, I don't know, honestly, that's really necessary to debate the, the primary premise of this uh, debate, which is, is, is veganism morality, uh, sorry, obligatory. I mean, what I would say is that no moral system is obligatory uh, because morality is subjective and that includes veganism. Uh, so, you know, I think what the way I would look at the way a, a lot of vegans think of things is that really they just care a lot about animals, which is fine. And they'd like to compel us to care as much as they do. But I just think we should acknowledge that not, not everyone feels the same way about these issues. And that's also fine. Ultimately, the way it's going to work out is everyone gets to vote over time. You know, we're going to create a new generation of people. We're going to pass our, our morality onto them. They're going to be culturally, culturally conditioned. And they're going to come to think that, you know, what we pass onto them is absolutely good and bad. But it really is just another form of, of, of new morality that's going to emerge out of our culture. You got done. it. Thank you very much, Professor. And we will jump into the open conversation, which will be about an hour, folks. And I want to let you know, we are pumped this Friday. For the first time in a while, we've missed Steven. So, folks, you don't want to miss it. It's going to be epic this Friday. Destiny will be back. In particular, Destiny's moral system will be on trial. It's he'll be debating Brenton Langle. So that should be a juicy one. And hit that subscribe button and that notification bell for reminders so you don't miss that debate or other juicy debates live. And so with that, we'll jump into the open conversation. As mentioned, the floor is all yours. Thanks, everybody. Where do you want to start? Um, well, I guess from, if I mean, if you don't mind, we can start. Uh, it sounds like Philip uh, is in the same boat as vegan uh, as a vegan would be, except you're unconvinced that buying dairy and eggs causes harm. Well, um, yeah, yeah. I'm unconvinced that the harms perpetuated by an industry, because at the end of the day, we are talking about the actions of other people, right? How, like, yeah. where are we responsible for the actions of other people? And um, w when, like, someone puts, like, a chicken in a blender or stomps on a baby calf, I believe that's really just done for profit maximization, and it's not really done to satisfy a demand. Therefore, I don't see how um, that harm can be properly attributable to my action of... Um, my action of like demanding like dairy and eggs. So it's, it's um, it would be like, I would say the industry causes it, not really the consumer. Um, well, so I guess I'm going to refer to, you said when someone puts uh, baby chicks in a blender, 
But uh, unfortunately, that is standard practice. It's kind of a given. Um, when a chicken lays eggs, you don't know, you know, if, if they're in the egg laying industry, you don't know if the chicks born from those eggs are going to be male or female. So the males are immediately discarded on day one because there's no use for them. Um, so that is almost, that's actually intrinsic in egg mm. production. Um, yeah. As far as yeah, I mean, and and also, like we said at the beginning, like veganism is not really concerned with maximizing harm reduction. We're concerned with exploiting sentient beings. Not exploiting. Or not exploiting uh, sentient beings. And so when you, you know, you forcibly breed chickens over generations to produce an egg every single day, uh, the egg laying process is very exploitative. The chickens get many diseases associated with over too many, laying too many eggs. And then at about a year and a half, 18 months, two years old, when the egg production slows, the chickens are discarded as well. So there is and direct... By, and by discarded, they are killed for meat. They're killed for meat, usually chicken nuggets or, you know, ground up chicken patties and, and things like that. Uh, you know, they're, they're clearly exploited for their reproductive systems. Female chickens are exploited and then the male chickens are killed because they're they're of the egg laying species they don't grow big and fast enough to be quote unquote meat birds so when you buy eggs you are paying for animal exploitation and animal suffering directly um yeah i, I would i would i would i wouldn't really um agree with that um so when you're, when you're paying um when you're paying for dairy and eggs you are paying for what's intrinsic in procuring dairy and eggs right and um it, like all the things that you said is absolutely true. Like people throwing uh, babies in blenders, um, how they um, breed these chickens in these harmful ways. And that is immoral. My problem is how that is attributable to the consumer. Um, because in my opinion, the harm is not intrinsic to that demand because it is possible. You can have like um, a chicken just as like a pet, right? Uh, and then you, it lays eggs and you just take it eggs and then send it to me. That's like satisfying my demand. And I don't think there's any harm there. Um, Where do you and buy your eggs? Chicken. I'm sorry. Where do you buy your eggs? Do you buy them from grocery stores, restaurants? Oh yeah, I do buy them from grocery stores, but- okay. um, So you're directly I, contributing to factory farmed eggs? Well, well, this this is really the point. Um, in my opinion, when there is harm, you have to decide who is accountable for that harm, right? You are, and you're buying factory farmed eggs. <laughs> but I wouldn't say that the harm is intrinsic to my demand. That harm is culpable that harm is attributable to the industry wanting to maximize a profit and wanting to um, make sure that um, uh, practices are as effective as possible, right? For me, what a demand is, is that you are paying for the procurement of eggs. And if there's nothing necessary, if the harm is not necessary in the procurement of eggs, then that, that I don't see how that's attributable to my action. That's like kind of saying it can be, we're like in the same boat, right? Because you can say that pesticide use, if you're eating maybe, if you can cut 500 calories um, out of your diet every week, you, sh you should do that. You're obligated to do that because pesticide use is, um, is pretty much a given in a lot of these crops, right? So it, it's kind of like, I don't see how pesticide use, because you can, there is, pos it is possible. I will concede that um, it's probably never going to happen, but that really wouldn't refute my point. It is possible and it's not intrinsic in your demand for crops that uh, animals are going to be harmed through pesticide use because it is possible that you can get that crop and satisfy demand without any harm. So therefore the person who actually uh, conducts the harm, that's who I believe is attributable, is accountable, not the consumer. Well, I don't, the thing is when it comes to um, the who is responsible, um, you know, in the case of, of, of slaughterhouse workers, for example, um, there, there's standard practice and then there's excessive abuse. Now both happen. Mm -hmm. uh, and like we said, you know, it is standard practice to grind up baby chicks alive. It is uh, standard practice to, if a dairy cow gives birth to a male calf, he goes directly into the veal industry. So our consumption of dairy is a direct directly supports the veal industry as well. Um, we as consumers are the ones who with our wallets, with our dollars, we vote with our dollars. We decide what we want companies, corporations to continue to produce. Um, so like, you know, when we lean away from those companies uh, and from those industries, we are saying, no, that's not what we want. Um, I, I can't say whether, for example, a slaughterhouse worker is going to 
smack a pig around or hit, you know, hit them unnecessarily. That I can't say. But again, it is standard practice, for example, to um, with egg laying chickens, once they're spent, they are used for meat. I mean, that's that's money for the corporation. Mm-hmm. I mean, I agree, but it's, it's really kind of missing uh, my entire point because um, I wouldn't say that interacting in a uh, commerce engagement with someone means entails that you support every single thing that they do. That's like saying, um, if I talk with someone, that means I support everything that they do, right? Uh, when I, no, it's, I, I, pardon for the interruption, but respectfully, no, you if you're, you, you drink milk and you eat butter and cheese and dairy products, right? Uh, I'm not really dairy. I have dairy. Yeah, I do. Okay. So where does dairy come from? The dairy comes from the, uh, cow. Okay. And why do cows, why do cows produce milk? For their calves. Exactly. They have to be pregnant to produce milk. They don't just make milk and leave it in buckets for us to pick up. Right. So if you want cow milk, you are paying for someone to come along and inseminate a cow against her will and take her baby when her baby is born because you want the milk that the baby is supposed to be drinking. That's just how a a dairy industry has to work. There's no way for a dairy industry to be profitable by waiting for cows to be impregnated naturally and then only taking the milk that the calf doesn't drink. And then when the cow doesn't produce as much milk as we'd like, feeding that cow for 18 years or 20 years and letting them die a natural death. It's just not that's not how the dairy industry works. How the dairy industry works is you pay for some cheese. There is a calf out there who got killed and a mother cow who got killed and a mother cow who was inseminated against her will, usually about four or five times before she's killed. So she loses four or five children throughout her life. And then she's killed and ground up into hamburgers. So you are directly paying for that. Yeah, I don't. I don't agree that I'm paying for that. When it I doesn't pay matter for, if you agree. Like you are. No, paying. I'm, I'm. I'm. I'm trying to explain to you why I don't. I don't think so. Right. So why I'm not really that convinced of that. Right. Because when you pay for dairy and eggs, you don't pay for um, the CEO to abuse his uh, to abuse his daughters. Right. You don't pay for the. We're not um, talking the about. That. We're right. talking right. about direct. Brian, Brian I. Uh, I let you talk, and I please talk. Okay, so you don't pay for every single harm. You pay for what is intrinsic in procuring that product. And I will concede that waiting for a cow to be pregnant, waiting for uh, it to um, have babies and just milk it, that's, it's never going to happen in the industry, right? But that is still missing the entire point. The missing the entire, uh, what's my point is that what is intrinsic in your demand, right? When you're talking about harm, you have to say who is accountable for that harm, right? You have to properly attribute that action to me as a consumer. And what I am doing as a consumer is that I am supporting the procurement of dairy. And if if there's nothing necessary, if harm is not necessary in the procurement of dairy, then that means harm is culpable for the people, person who actually does the harm. The harm happens whether you think it's necessary or not. It happens as part of the industry. It can't function without the harm. I agree. I agree. The harm happens all the time. I just don't think it's accounted. It's attributable. I just don't think it's attributable to the consumer. The harm in that yeah, case, there is harm. There is harm. I concede there is harm. I just don't see how it's uh, attributable to the to the consumer. So you concede that you cause direct exploitation and harm with your dollar, but you're not convinced that you cause direct exploitation and harm with your dollar? No, I'm not convinced I, I cause direct exploitation. What I cause is the procurement of dairy and eggs. Anything Are else, you- anything else, any harm other than that is attributable to the industry. So when you when you are right, uh, Brian, let me ask you this: um, Do you do you t- engage in any type of hedonistic, non-essential commodity uh, consumer cons- uh, consumption? Hedonistic, like watching movies or something. Or like if you want like a new T-shirt and you buy a new T-shirt, or if you want like a like a like a toy for your cat or something, do you engage in anything like that? Non-essential commodity. Um, yeah, consumption? everyone does that. I mean, we do try to buy used whenever possible, but yeah. I think okay, so why are you not morally obligated to abstain from doing that where um, in order to get the cotton for your clothing, you need to animals need to be burned alive by pesticides where their their guts are literally turned inside out with these pesticides so you can have a new shirt or these uh, animals and insects that are run over by 18 wheelers every time you want to transport it. Why are you not accountable for that? 
we are accountable for those deaths, but that's the best system that we have at the moment for procuring the goods that we need. It's not directly. Ex well, uh, I'm not saying that you need, right? I'm talking about something non-essential. Okay. Just, just to be sure yeah. that uh, we hear from Brian too. I appreciate uh, both okay. sides' my passion. Man, man, man. You guys I'm are sorry. both passionate, and I love so, it from both of you. Yeah. I would say, yeah, we can replace it with want, but when you're eating like corn tortillas, right? You have to grow corn to make these corn tortillas. And we are aware as vegans that there are crop deaths associated with growing crops. But the intention behind growing crops is to grow them and protect them so that we can make food. We know that we would have to protect these crops against insects in the same way that if a human being came over and threatened to burn down our cornfield, like we would wanna protect our crops from the human being threatening to burn down our cornfield, right? We can't reason with insects and ask them, hey, can you please stay away from our crops? But we recognize that this is the best system that we have. Obviously there's veganic farming and more and more farms that switch over to veganic farming. We will happily support those farms, but this is the best system that we have to cause the least amount of exploitation and suffering as possible. So can I just uh, can I just interject for a second? I think um, there's yeah. a little bit of loss in translation happening. I think um, what Phil is asking is basically, shouldn't aren't you, according to this philosophy, aren't you morally compelled to consume the minimum required for your survival? Right. Like, like, um, we understand that we understand that some degree of animal death is required. And exploitation is required for us just to live. Right. You need to eat. Um, but if you want to minimize exploitation, which is your philosophy, you should consume the, the minimum number of crops to to um, to survive. Minimizing harm is not the philosophy of veganism. The philosophy of veganism. But minimizing is exploitation. Exploitation, correct. And it's not intrinsically exploitative to grow tomatoes. There, there's no. Even though, even though we don't have to kill animals. Tomatoes, for tomatoes will. Even though you know that if you go to buy tomatoes at the grocery store, lots of animal deaths had to happen. That was the same argument you're making with Phil earlier. Yeah, we, we recognize that animal and insect deaths may have happened, but it is not part of the food product itself. What we want are tomatoes. When you Do want you agree with Philip? Huh? <laughs> Do you agree with Philip? You pretty much agree with me, Brian. No, we don't, because when you want a piece of cheese on your on your uh, Boca burger, you have what is required to get cheese is to forcibly impregnate a cow steal her baby and steal her milk. That is required, Philip. That is required. That's just it's not required. It's that not, is it's required. Not, it's, I mean, not it's not necessary. You buy cheese at the grocery store, you just said. Hold on. But, it, but the way the way you get cheese is not a necessity. It's not intrinsic. Yes, it is. It is possible. Is it, is it, Brian, is it possible that you can get cheese without like um, raping it, without um, harming its calf? Is it possible? It's called no. vegan cheese. <laughs> yeah, vegan cheese. Well, not I think Philip is actually he's literally he's literally saying like you can wait for a cow to be naturally pregnant. But that's not and, the way it And then you can go yeah, but, right, right. That's okay. in your you alternate it, reality. You, right, but you you guys made the argument that you can eat tomatoes because um you're not responsible for the animal deaths required to generate those tomatoes. We didn't, say that. we didn't say we're not responsible. Wait. We said we recognize that crop deaths occur, but intrinsically when you grow a crop, the point is to grow a crop intrinsically involved in dairy is raping an animal, stealing her milk and stealing her baby. You have to do that to get the breast milk from the animal. She has to be pregnant. There, there's no way to get cow milk without a cow being pregnant. She's a mammal. She has to be pregnant, but you don't need to rape a cow for it to be pregnant because it is possible for it to be the other way. It's and I will concede- but that's not how most of the world acquires milk. In order for know, the milk industry to work, it has to be acquired forcibly. I know, Anna, Anna, I know. But when you're talking about what is intrinsic, you kind of contradict yourself. You say that it's intrinsic, but it's not intrinsic. And if it's not intrinsic, then you accept that we're culpable for all extrinsic types of harm. So when you buy um, vegan products, right, your money actually goes to the wages of non-vegans who use their money to buy meat. Therefore, that means are you accountable for um, the meat that they buy as well? No, because we're buying the vegan product. 
We're not so buying also, the, the, so the what groceries. If I tell you, what if I use your own reasoning against you, right? What if I say um, it, it's it, it's some fantasy land where uh, a company is always non-vegan, right? That's okay, fine. But in these in these companies, right, there are non-vegans who work there, and they use their wages gained from your uh, from you from your demand from you uh, profitizing that in, uh, that industry, and they use their wages to buy meat. Right. So that means that means that you perpetuate uh, factory farming because you buy vegan products. Is that like that's the exact same reasoning that you use against me? That that sounds like exactly what you said in your opening statement of if you pay someone for a yellow shirt and they murder someone, you don't feel like you're responsible for that murder because all you did was pay for a yellow shirt. So what we're mm -hmm. saying is we're paying for corn tortillas at the grocery store. We're not responsible for the owner of the grocery store's meat purchases. We're yeah, showing demand for vegan products at his establishment. Right. And I'm uh, furthering the demand of um, cheese and dairy. Not, and not How are they going to get more cheese and dairy? Not, not, for rape, not for raping a cow or putting chicks in a blender. I, I mean, I don't understand where we can go from here, because if you're unwilling to concede that you must impregnate a cow in order to get milk from the cow, then I just don't know where we can go on this topic any further like yeah i would agree must... i think it's probably better we just move mm -hmm. on i mean move on kind of going mm -hmm. in circles uh, can I ask, can I ask, we uh... haven't heard an argument from professor yet and so this is a great opportunity I'll, I'll kick it right back to you professor one moment just want to let you know folks we have updated so the charity that we'll be giving to is save the children uh someone let me know so sorry this is like not at all obviously to have ever taken a, a stance and that's why we actually changed the charity because i i don't know for sure but someone had said that they think uh, that the original charity would be kind of partial in one way or another for this debate topic. So we have changed it to a like 99.9% .9 guaranteed to be neutral regarding this topic type of charity. And so 100% of Super Chats will be going to that charity for today's debate. And so thanks so much for your Super Chats that have come in. Plus, uh, we will jump back into, as I had mentioned, uh, Professor, and I want to also mention really quick, our guests are linked in the description, folks. So if you want to hear more from our guests, please click on their links. They're waiting right there at the top of the description box right there for you. And that includes if you're listening via our podcast, folks. So we have a podcast now. If you have not heard, we are excited about it. And if you are listening via podcast, you can also access our guest links in the description box of the podcast. Ah, okay. So thanks so much. And the floor is all yours, Professor. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I have a question uh, for those annoying vegans. Um, I've heard you say in previous um, videos that you've uploaded that you're against animal testing uh, for like pharmaceuticals. Is that is that true? We haven't really made a video. Uh, yeah, we haven't. We maybe mentioned it, but we haven't dedicated a full video to it. Yeah, I know. I mean, Anna did. Anna actually did a human trial for a particular medication at one point. Obviously, if animal testing can be avoided and you can still get a good product. Um, we recognize though that we live in a non-vegan world and a lot of organizations require animal testing in order for products to make it to the market. So right. it's, it's right, I guess, uh, what I What I heard in the video, I don't think it was a video specifically on animal testing. I think it was mentioned uh, sort of offhand, um, just a comment, but I just wanted to confirm that you you are against animal testing for, for like uh, research and, and drug, drug testing and so on. Yes, yeah. I think uh, we're we're in, at a point of evolution where alternate methods are being used, uh, whether it's computer programs or volunt uh, human volunteers. Uh, so we're okay. sort of rooting in that direction. So yeah, I guess I have a little bit just to, to say about that. I, I actually wonder if you might want to change your stance on this, but I actually know a thing or two about this um, based on my work. And uh, I guess what I would say is that um, animal testing is not the only place where, like animal testing for pharmaceuticals or like products that you buy at the, the grocery store, or whatever, that's not the only place where animals are used or are exploited in, in science. Um, in, in biomedical research, animals are the central tool that's used to do biomedical research. Uh, almost every um, study that's done, if it doesn't directly require the exploitation of animals, literally the the generation of a specific uh, organism, like a, a model organism, a mouse, and then it's, it's you know, death. Um, if it doesn't do that directly, it does indirectly. Essentially, all biomedical scientists uh, require their their work is tangentially related to to the work that people with animals do. Almost all of it. The, the data scientists who basically take all the data that comes out and try to make sense of it. People that are building new model systems. People that are uh, 
take, you know, take, uh, developing new measurement methods to to make sense of what's going on in the experiments. So I just I guess you don't have to take my word for it. Um, you, you can look it up on the internet. I think Stanford has a website basically talking about this. Uh, and you can talk to other scientists. But basically, I guess what I'd say is that um, if you truly did outlaw animal testing, you would basically stop biomedical research um, as, as it is practiced today. And again, you don't have to take my word for it. I would be very um, you know, very bullish on that point. Uh, and so you know that also means that all of the drugs that we have today, right, uh, that have been developed, they've all required a huge amount of animal exploitation. So all the cancer therapies, HIV drugs that um, people use to live, basically. You know, HIV was a death sentence when it when it was first developed, and we now have these amazing drugs that allow you to live essentially indefinitely with them. Those require a huge amount of animal testing. Um, the new antibody treatments for COVID, those are actually, I believe they actually come from animals, actually generated in animals, uh, or at least they were tested in animals. The new vaccine that was developed, that was a body of work that took decades of animal-based of animal -based research to get to a vaccine. So you know, if you really think that it's immoral to you to exploit animals in these instances, what you're saying is that all of this science that has led, led to these amazing um, therapies and so on, drugs, was immoral and that we should stop it. And I know that you guys are we, against one, the, one, just, know, the, just the needless suffering. We've been going for a while. I, I just want to give a chance for Brian and Anna to respond, and then I promise we'll come right back to you. Okay. Well, the, you know, the beauty of, of society, society and, and my hope is that we evolve and become smarter and find new ways and different ways. So yes, there are things that unfortunately we cannot change. Um, and you know, the, what we, the only thing we can do is worry about what we're doing now. But I mean, are you using, I mean, the, cause obviously like animal testing is, uh, a very, you know, it's a tricky thing. A lot of the times animal testing is required. It's part, it's woven into our society. It's, it's, it's needed in some case, you know, like people need cancer medication, people need HIV medication, like you said, um, or the COVID vaccine. But what does that have to do with like needlessly impregnating cows for dairy? Like that's the problem. I mean, that's a, I'm talking right now. I'm just trying to, to, I guess my point is that you are for animal exploitation in some circumstances. Well, we, 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 we've said that like as far as is possible and practicable is in the definition and we focus on needless, needless exploitation, needless harm. Eating a cheeseburger is needless. If you need- I, mean, I would disagree with that. Because you have cancer, you, you need it, but you don't need to eat bacon. Well, Brian, I'm sorry. Right, so what about I, like if you have a headache and you know you can like deal with this headache, right? Um, so are you saying you're morally obligated to not take Tylenol because that money would go to a company that further animals uh, testing? So are you saying that um, people should not have Tylenol if they feel like they can de deal with the headache? I mean, that's usually my method is to not take medicine needlessly. Like if I can just drink some water and, and get over a headache, then obviously I would prefer that over ibuprofen or pain relief. But if someone goes in for surgery and they need pain relief, like this is all, it's all based on need. Like, do you need it? And there are also like cruelty-free generic versions of lots of medications available these days anyway. But I don't right, understand. But, I mean, do you not? Impregnating cows. Well, I think we're not talking about impregnating cows. We're talking about developing drugs. But I mean, do you not see that the definition of needless is subjective? Like what you might consider to be a necessary therapy, you know, HIV drugs is not necessarily considered to be necessary by everybody uh, or cancer therapies or the COVID vaccine, right? And basically, the point is that animal exploitation was required and is required basically to do biomedical research. So if you want biomedical research to continue, you need to accept the fact that animal exploitation is an enormous part of that. I would argue it is the central tool that we use in this in that science. We and don't um have to accept anything we can work towards finding new di new ways mm -hmm. different ways i know for example like you know back when i was in high school uh our ap bio class was dissecting uh f f pig fetuses pig fetuses uh now they're using computer programs i mean there there are different ways that it, where we can find a different way we should mm -hmm. of course of course, and I think there are many scientists trying to do that, but the fact is, is that um, today uh, there is no alternative to animal testing because animals are very complicated. Human beings are extremely complicated organisms. Uh, we don't have computer simulations that can accurately model humans. Uh, systems based on like cells, you know, individual cells and things, non-sentient beings aren't complicated enough. You absolutely need, an need animals. And like I said, you don't have to take my word, word on this, but you know, if, if, if you want to know whether or not you should support biomedical research and animal testing, uh, I guess you need to de determine for yourself whether it's truly needless suffering, uh, needless exploitation. And uh, I would argue that it, it really is 
And, and most people that I think are listening to this would probably argue that you know, we need science to continue, biomedical science to continue. And unfortunately, we have to accept the fact that animal exploitation is a, is a central part of that. But we don't need double bacon cheeseburgers at Hardee's to continue, right? So by I agree. that, that, that I mean, that, you would be vegan in every other aspect of your life except for animal testing. In order yeah, to I mean, I guess my so, point here was oh, just sorry. to say that um, I guess my point was just to say that you know you guys uh, you know, don't point the finger at the omnivore here and say you're the only one interested in exploiting animals, right? Um, you you as we're well not, are we're not saying that. animals under the right, and I think but I think many people do. I think they they boil this argument down to something very black and white and very simple, very sim simplistic, I would say. And uh, I think that if you want to really think about this clearly, you know, you recognize that animal exploitation is sort of, at least at this point in our, in our, you know, development as a species, it's, it's just necessary. And people, different people draw a line at different places for what they consider to be acceptable. And it's based on their personal preferences and there's essentially no, you know, objective standard to, to choose. And, and so we just all just get to choose. It's not necessary. We won't. We we don't settle. I mean, again, if we find a different way of doing things, for example, when we find out, uh, for example, like non-related to animals, but sort of indirectly. I mean, we've done our very best to minimize our use of plastic. You know, if if we find a product that comes in glass versus plastic, we opt for the glass. It's it's just you seem to have, be taking this stance of we just have to accept that that's the way it is. And it's going to be this way. And at the same time, I think, I, I think it was, sorry, Gracie's sitting on my notebook. <laughs> I think it was um, you who had stated, uh, you know, s s the way, the reason things are the way they are is because of the social contracts that we've created, which, which actually, uh, sure, that's true, but it ignores our evolution as a society because we, we're always evolving. Um, so just because something is a certain way today doesn't mean it needs to be next year or tomorrow. Um, you know, that would be ignoring all the progress we've made as a society regarding any other injustices that we've fought mm -hmm. against. I mean, whether it's women's right to vote or um, uh, gay marriage, you know, once upon a time, right. people used to say, well, that's just the way it is. That's the way right. it's going to be. And we just need to be okay with that. So yeah, I mean, well, I guess could I could I respond to that or was mm -hmm. there more? Yeah. No, go for it. Uh, yeah, I mean, I guess what I would say is that um the way I think of morality is sort of from like an empirical perspective, which I think of morality as an evolved human trait. It's it's a trait that humans evolved because we live in groups. And there is no real direction to evolution. You know, evolution just just goes, right? Um and if you think about the purpose of, of morality, it's a social contract. It's, an, it's a naturally evolved social, social contract. And there's really only one constraint, which is that for a moral system to continue, to, for, for a society with a given moral system to perpetuate itself, it must have a stable social contract. Beyond that, beyond that minimal constraint, there's really no um, clear direction that the culture needs to go. I know that many people... Um, I hear this with, from vegans that there's a clear trajectory where veganism is going to be the end point. Um, and I, just, I don't know if that's actually true because human beings have multiple instincts, right, uh, that have been bred into us. You know, we, we like to feel good. We like to be free. Indeed, we do feel empathy towards animals, right? The problem is that animals can't reciprocate social contract. So the, the, um, the purpose of the in evolution is actually sort of misguided in that sense. You know, empathy was, was evolved in humans to make sure that um, we could understand how other humans, other people that could reciprocate the social contract would behave in response to our behaviors, our actions, right? Animals can't do that. Uh, and so it's not clear to me that, that extending protections to them actually leads to a better moral system. But for sure, uh, veganism, uh, veganism does reduce individual liberty and well-being. And so maybe we'll end up as a, as a vegan society. I certainly agree it could be possible, but I don't think it's so, so absolutely clear that that's going to be the end point. I don't think that it's necessarily the morally most righteous endpoint. What I, what I want to do is I want to give uh, those uh, Brian and Anna a chance to respond, mm -hmm. and then also want to jump uh, back over to Philip eventually. So, Philip, if you want to jump in after Brian and Anna have a chance to respond, uh, I guess. Well, two thoughts came to mind there. You say animals are incapable of reciprocating social contracts. That's true for some human beings, like toddlers and infants are not capable of reciprocating people social with, contracts yeah. or people with mental disabilities or there's, you know, people with dementia. There's a number of human beings that wouldn't fit into that category. So that can't be the 
<laughs> like the, the common the, denominator. The, yeah, the, the core denominator. of your your moral uh, philosophy. No, the point is that um, the point is that you make a rule that says don't don't harm other humans, right? And that's the social contract. So even yeah. if somebody is mentally disabled and they can't reciprocate, they're still a human. Well, convince me why I shouldn't harm a human. Well, because of the social contract, humans are, are moral mm -hmm. agents, right? So, so um, you 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 have to you rely on other humans in order to exist in society, and so it's in your interest to treat them with the same respect you would like. And if we mm -hmm. and so we make a rule, we make a rule, and society says don't don't kill humans, and that leads to a stable moral system, and, and the society perpetuates perpetuates itself, and ultimately human you know people born into that society think think killing humans is wrong, um, but it's not necessarily fundamentally wrong. It's just uh, condition of the culture that we're in that gave rise to a social uh, to a stable society. Well, it's but, also in our best interest as a, you know, in terms of our survival as a species, not to kill each other. Um, exactly. Yeah, but I, I I would also, you know, well, I guess I would say so. In in your opinion, like slavery when it was common in the United States, that was moral, right? I mean, slaves are human, so. Uh, if if um, you want to maximize the well-being of all humans, uh, or give give the maximally stable social contract, then you would want to extend um, moral consideration to, to all humans. Yeah. With confirmation bias, because people back then might have not thought that that slaves were human at all. In fact, even uh, 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 victims of the Holocaust, uh, they were they were dubbed. Untermensch, which essentially means vermin. I mean, the thing is, when you're speaking from the point point of view of like several several decades later, uh, I, that's an obvious position to take. But from the point of view of the oppressor mm. back in the day, that was not the belief then. Uh, our morality right. does evolve. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, and I think that's an interesting point, which is how does it evolve, right? And I believe that. Uh, the way it evolves is is to generate maximum stability. I don't think that a slave owning society is as stable as the society we have today, or a society that perpetuates holocausts on on people for very arbitrary reasons is a stable society. I think that you know clearly we have a much more stable society today because we don't do these things. In addition, um, causing harm to humans is it comes with a, a great deal of empathetic pain towards the people inflicting the harm. And so you'd imagine that over time you'd expect um, cultures to want to minimize the sympathetic pain that they're going to experience. So I think there is a direction for societies, for moralities and societies that, that it does go. You want, a, you want a very stable society and you want to minimize the amount of harm that you, the amount of pain that you feel uh, to inflicting pain on all beings. I would argue all beings, including animals. Uh, but um, that doesn't mean that you have to be vegan, right? Because I guess the point is that since animals can't contribute to the social contract, there's not actually a direct benefit by extending protections to those animals. It's sort of an indirect benefit by potentially leading to a more stable society between humans. But my argument earlier was that that's not so clear that that's actually going to work be the case because that that um, extending those protections comes at major costs to many humans in the actual society. Humans like me who like to hunt or eat animals, right? How do you justify to me that I should give up these uh, these benefits in order to extend protections to an animal that can't reciprocate in any way? For the same reason, we extend those benefits to humans who can't reciprocate in any way. Right, but see, I've been I've been raised in a society where I've been culturally conditioned to believe that killing humans is wrong. That's not the case for animals. That's so why I, I asked feel, you. So, if you were raised in a society where beating women was okay, you'd be, you'd be okay with beating women. What do you mean by okay? You would Acceptable. you would find it morally permissible to beat women if you grew up in a society if, like if, beating women would, would be say, morally permissible in your view if the society accepted it. No, what I would say is that okay, um, you're inconsistent. The way, well, let me explain. What I would say is that uh, the way you determine whether or not an action is moral is based on the moral code, the moral system of that society. So being in that society, you would believe, even if this is this goes for you too, not just me, for any, any human being in these societies, if you are culturally conditioned to believe that that action is moral, you will probably think it's moral. The reason that it is seen as moral in those societies is because most of the people in those societies believe it to be moral. Now we can look you know, 200 years later back and say, well, those people were savages, but uh, what's the point of doing that? Right, we we experienced a different cultural conditioning from them. Okay. We've lived 200 years. Society has advanced, and now we think that beating women is wrong, and slavery is wrong, and Holocausts are wrong, uh, and that's cultural conditioning. Yeah. Well, we were conditioned in the same culture as you, yet we believe that you shouldn't harm non-humans, and you don't. So clearly, there isn't a stable um, social contract that we operate by because there are millions of vegans the world over 
who believe that harming pigs is the same as harming dogs. Like if you saw someone kicking a dog, would that bother you personally? Right. So, so this is an excellent point. So it would, would bother, that you bother you personally to see yeah, someone. Yeah, it, would totally, it would totally bother me personally because I was raised in a society where kicking dogs is wrong and, and it, it feels so wrong when I see that. Why don't you extend that to pigs? Well, because pigs are food. I mean, in my society, pigs, pigs are, are food. not food. Pigs are living sentient beings who want to live. The same as dogs. The same as dogs. They're actually true. smarter than dogs. We created that difference. We created that distinction. That is an arbitrary distinction. You know what I mean? Exactly. It is arbitrary. Our culture, the particulars of so our culture are, are basically arbitrary. arbitrary. No, sentience is not arbitrary, but you're saying you actively discriminate based on species, which is arbitrary. Uh, I mean, all I'm saying is that there is no one uh, perfect moral system. There's no one superior moral system. The system that we have is the one that we inherited from our forefathers and mothers. And we, we believe are, certain we things to rejecting. be right and wrong. So you, you don't believe that, you, you don't believe that with the way you the way you feel it's about certain things has to do with nature and nurture, like you know your natural instincts and the culture that you were raised in. My family used to raise pigs for slaughter. My whole family, no one in my entire family is vegan except for myself. I reject that mentality. I don't want to be a part of needlessly abusing animals just because you like the taste of bacon or you like the taste of cheese. I think that that is a needless reason. It's it's sensory pleasure. It's, it's nothing more, it's, it's no different than saying, oh, I just really like to watch pigs get slaughtered. I just enjoy the, the ocular sensation of watching pigs die. It's the same thing as saying that I enjoy the taste of their flesh. It's a sensory pleasure that you're using to justify harming a sentient being. So I think that is wrong. And the reason I think that is wrong is because sentience is the ability to experience joy or pain or suffering. So if you aren't that is, sentient... That is the common denominator. Yeah. I mean, every animal experiences joy, pain, fear. So, why, I mean, even if you don't care about animals, there is a degree of respect that, that we owe them. I mean, you said, too, that uh, as, a, as a species, there is... A, we benefit from essentially exploiting them, maybe in, not in those words, but we benefit as a society from turning some animals into food. Well, I mean, look what's happening with our oceans. I mean, we are overfishing crazy amounts. And, and if we lose our ocean, we die. And that's because people want to eat fish. And, and trawling is a thing. And it's seaspiracy, by the way, now on Netflix. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Can I ask you guys another uh, question then related to this, which is, um, are you okay with lab-grown meat? Uh, it's, we would prefer it over I wouldn't eat meat. it, but yeah. yes, as... An, I mean, as are you okay with someone like, like me eating lab-grown meat? You prefer that over me eating it? Yeah. An actual well, you don't kill an animal to get their cells, and we know that you can get... Biopsy, you which, know, you can, which, by the way, I mean, it's still exploitative, but it is an incremental, it's a step towards... Hmm just eliminating the, the full exploitation, the death and torture yeah. of those animals. What so about, um, what about to appeal to someone like me? So I actually don't eat hamburgers. Um, you know, if I'm going to eat meat, I'm going to have, I, you know, I do a cause benefit analysis. I'm only going to eat something that's truly delicious, like a primal cut or like a ribeye. Um, you're not going to be able to make that um, by throwing a bunch of cells in a Petri dish. So what if it turned out that in order to yeah. grow a steak, right, that I would eat, that you needed to grow a whole pig, right? Uh, you can make it not sentient. Right, so so we use ma the magic of science. We grow a pig, and uh, it's not sentient. Are you okay with me eating that? It's not sentient. So I presume if sentience is your trait, that um, if it's not sentient, you kind of don't care what it looks like. I can eat it, right? Well, yeah. Yeah, if the if an organism is like carrots aren't sentient, we eat carrots. So in, in so this what about what? Thing, I'm going to ask you the same question that Vegan Gains asked me. I might debate with him. What about a non-sentient human? Mm. If they're non-sentient, it doesn't, I mean, I, I don't they care. have, if you, if you want to eat a non-sentient human, that's on you. But, but do you find it morally acceptable for me to eat a, a non-sentient human? Yeah, yeah. I don't, I don't see a, you grew a non-sentient human in a Petri dish. No, no, it? it's a, it's a human. It's a literal human, but he's not sentient. Like, but humans are sentient. So you're, you're changing. No, there, there are examples, there are examples of, of humans that are not sentient. They have uh, various kinds of genetic disorders. A uh, disease can, can eat your brain basically make you not sentient, uh, this can actually happen. So th there are examples of this uh, where there's essentially a human being that has the sentience of a plant, 
are you okay with you're saying your your moral system means it's okay for me to eat that person kill and eat that person they have a I mean, I would need, yeah, I would need to see evidence that no family, an actual human being is capable of no longer being sentient. I mean, no longer being sentient means being dead. Like they have a car crash, a spike goes through their head, but they survive. Right, this happens. So they're not they're sentient. They're in a coma. They have no family. No one cares about them. Wait, um, they're just a, a non-sentient human. What, I, I guess I'm just curious. Like, why are we talking about non-sentient human beings in car crashes when you just said that you actively pay for sentient cows to be killed so you can eat their ass meat? Like, well, because what? I'm trying to understand. I'm kind of confused because you, you're okay with me growing up a, a pig that's non-sentient and eating it, right? Because your trait is sentience. So that just, to me, it seems logically to follow. Like you grew and it, you grew all the cells. If it has a, a mother, you can't eat it. That's the rule. I thought it was sentience. I thought we started this saying that your rule is sentience. Our rule I'm just saying it's a sentient human. human. It's a non-sentient human. Can I kill and eat it? Is that morally justifiable? I don't know I that a non-sentient human exists. exists. And that's the thing is we're talking <laughs> hypothetics. Like when there is the reality is you can just walk to the store and buy meat off the shelf or go into your the forest. Okay, so grant me this. If, let's say, let's say for a thought experiment, let's say a non-sentient human did exist. Okay, so... Just pretend why, that it exists. Why are we bothering with this thought experiment when it's completely irrelevant. not rele irrelevant to the reality of the way? And you don't want to answer the question, I guess. I did mention earlier that I, I do want to, because Philip has been left out for quite a while. I eventually, you want to see you guys. So uh, <laughs> I'll kick it over, Brian and Anna. If you have one last kind of answer you want to give to uh, Professor, otherwise we'll, we'll kick it over to Philip just to hear, uh, as we haven't heard from him for a while. I mean, nothing that would that wouldn't lead us down another. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> one just, of those. I had one more thing, but I'm, I'll leave it till for later. Philip can go. Thank you. Um, <laughs> so I just want to know um, when you think of something as morally obligatory, what are your standards for judging what is morally obligatory? Like, why um, why is the harm done when like a vegan buys a new computer? Um, other vegans wouldn't say that that's uh, that's wrong. What, even though you can trace back harm to like um, so sometimes in like even like um, African slave mines, right, for the cobalt in it, um, or like um, animals uh, harmed in like the excavation sites or in the processing facilities, things like that. Why, um, why is that not like abstaining from buying a new computer when you could just use your old computer? Why is that not a moral obligation, but other things are like um, abstaining from buying milk or eggs? Like, what are your standards for dictating what is a moral obligation? Well, again, What's intrinsic to producing eggs and dairy is animal exploitation. What's intrinsic to building a computer is uh, assembling the parts and building the computer. When you buy a, a slice of cheese, you know for a fact that a mammal was raped against her will and her breast milk was stolen so you could have that piece of cheese, right? We don't know for a fact what goes into other forms of you know, building cars or building computers or making t-shirts, all the things that you've mentioned. Now, personally, Anna and I, um, we do try to buy used. We do try to buy secondhand. This laptop that we're talking to you on right now was pre-owned. You know, Anna's laptop was pre-owned. Like we, we try to minimize buying new goods, but we're talking about direct animal exploitation and harm when you're talking about things like eggs, dairy, and meat, and leather, and wool, and all of these other animal product-based uh, Okay. Um, well, um, there are a couple of things I could say to that. Um, I can agree that a lot of times um, with commodity production, you don't know how much harm the extent of the harm is, but I think it's more reasonable to conclude that there is at least some harm rather than absolutely zero harm at all. We're um, not claiming that there's zero harm. We've never claimed that. That's why it, <laughs> We've as, never claimed as far that. as is possible. Well, you said you don't know, right? I think it's reasonable to assume that you there is harm, right? But then you you kind of said you don't know whether it is, right? But it is reasonable to conclude that no matter what commodity production you engage in, that there is harm. And I can yeah. use the same argument. I can say yeah. um, with a laptop, right? When you clear the uh, the mines for the excavations, so you are killing insects and animals, right? Driving animals from their homes. I can say that that's also intrinsic in um, clearing the mines so you can get that new computer, right? So what would be your response to that? But that's the thing, it's as far as is possible and practicable is literally par part of the definition of veganism. When we know better, we do better. Okay, so if we know there is a better way to acquire, you know, if we, if we know that, 
uh, people are exploited for our laptops, then we try to buy secondhand. Again, you know, all my clothes are literally out of Mercari, which is like literally a secondhand online shop. Uh, <laughs> would, no you, would you blame someone? No would you blame to, a vegan? There is no way to eliminate suffering Unless you don't exist. Completely. Yeah. The air you breathe, the, the footsteps you take outside, but we do what we can. Yeah, but that, that's like, that's what um, meat eaters use. That's an appeal to futility. There's no reason we, there's like no way we can eliminate all harm. Therefore, I can buy that new t-shirt. I can buy that new computer. I can drive that car to the basketball court, even though I can ride my bike, right? Because you can't eliminate all harm doesn't mean you shouldn't try to eliminate the most harm. <laughs> Yeah, but would you say it's morally obligatory? Like, what if I want to go play basketball down the street and I drive my car, which con contributes to global pollution, right? Um, which actually harms the animal and threatens the the um, all life on Earth, right? Um, and I can easily ride my bike. Would you say, would you morally condemn me for not riding my bike? Would you say I'm obligated to ride my bike instead of take my car? That depends on how much of an emergency you think our environment <laughs> is. I mean... I mean, with the, the studies on global warming, I mean, didn't they say like by 2050, it's it's going to be pretty devastating? And Especially a lot of people, people keep buying dairy and eggs. Yeah. Well, the, well, there, the burning of fossil fuels is actually much greater than animal agriculture. So you can't no, say that. Not. No, it's not. Actually, animal agriculture emits the most carbon emissions, even more than all transportation combined. Well, I didn't say transportation. I said the burning of fossil fuels, right? So, um, I mean, we can have a debate on that. I don't, I'm not really, I'm not into that. We're, we're not science into thing. Any debate on that because, like we said, veganism is about exploiting animals. When you buy cheese, you're exploiting animals. When you drive your car, you're trying to get from point A to point B. It's reasonable to assume you might hit an insect in the car. It's reasonable to assume you might hit a human being by accident by driving your car. But it's still, you're just trying to get from point A to point B. When you buy a leather wallet or a piece of meat or an egg, you know for a fact that either an animal or several animals were exploited and harmed needlessly for that product. I also know when I buy, but, um, when a vegan buys corn, I also know that a lot of animals were harmed for that. And uh, a vegan can, uh, corn is actually one of the highest crops that use pesticide use as well. So the vegans the are- of corn is grown to feed livestock animals. Vegans don't eat that much corn or soy. Yeah, but that's a two quote quay, right? That's like saying, oh, meat eaters eat corn, therefore I'm okay with eating corn, right? Um, with that, and I forgot where I was going with that, um, but. I mean, if you claim to care so much about <laughs> you, insects, yeah, you, you, uh, I mean, it is, it is, we are, most of our, a huge part of our land use is for animal agriculture. Rainforests yeah. are cleared for it, and we, mo and we grow most of our corn and soy to feed livestock. Like a single cow can eat, 25 pounds of grain in a day. That's one cow in one day. And 10 billion cows are murdered every single year just in the US. Now that's so, like, think of the bill, that, that's billions of pounds of grain. <laughs> I, mean, I agree. No, I agree. There is harm in the world and that something definitely needs to be done about it. Just like how def something needs to be done about homelessness or something needs to be done about child rape. Right. But I don't see how it's attributable to the consumer. Philip, you know? can, we can I ask you a question? Like, why do, you, why do you believe or why do you feel morally justified in raping cows for cheese that you don't need? Well, that's a loaded question because I don't rape any cows for you pay for cows to be. Why do you feel it's morally justified to pay for cows to be raped in order to produce breast milk, which then gets turned into cheese for you to buy at the grocery store? That's also a loaded question because I don't pay for cows to be raped. Yes, you do. No, I don't. Just like how you pay for animals to be killed and whenever you buy a T-shirt or, or food. We're Philip, on the same boat. Cheese comes from breast milk. Of you course. Have to you have to impregnate a cow to get breast milk from the cow. No. Yes. Oh my God. Yes, what? you do. Hold you on. Don't. You do know. You cows. don't have to impregnate a cow to Hold get on. breast milk from a cow. You do. Know it means cows. it has You're to be the pregnant. Cows can't. It has to be pregnant. It doesn't. Yeah, it has you to be pregnant. pregnant. You don't need to impregnate. That's like saying a human needs to be raped in order to be pregnant. But but in the industry, Hello. we've already discussed, in the industry, it is not economically viable for farmers to just let cows breed. It is right. not what happens. They yeah, I agree. Eliminated. Collectively, collectively, to fulfill a collective uh, demand, it is not economically viable. And you can and you can argue that collectively it is necessary. But to satisfy, I'm not responsible for the demand other people uh, partake in. I'm only responsible for my own demand, right? In order to satisfy my own demand. 
I'm sorry? You're part of the collective. Yeah, exactly. So I agree. Like as a collective goal, we can make small incremental changes so we can reach a collective goal. But I don't uh, agree with morally blaming someone who buys uh, milk and eggs when, when a lot of commodity production, there is harm entailed in that as well. Okay, you do know. Okay, so you're, you say you're vegetarian. That means you don't eat meat. You don't eat the flesh of an animal, correct? Right. But in purchasing eggs and in purchasing dairy, those animals that are, that are used for the production of eggs and dairy still go to the slaughterhouse at the end of their, of their reproductive cycles. Mm -hmm. They are still used for, for meat. So you are indirectly supporting the meat industry by consuming eggs and dairy. No, like I said, I don't believe my demand for dairy and eggs um, supports that, right? Okay. I don't believe the sky is blue, <laughs> well, but it to, is. If you it want is. to say, you have to be able to prove that the sky is blue, right? And, you, and I just don't think- We are you proving to you that you, you like to eat butter and cheese and ice cream and other dairy products. Dairy comes from cow breast milk. In order for cows to produce breast milk, they have to be pregnant. And the way right. they are impregnated is forcefully against their will. Yeah, but it's not intrinsic that you need to It is intrinsic because is the, intrinsic. the dairy industry cannot be profitable without forceful impregnation. Collectively, it cannot be profitable, but for my own personal demand, yes, you can do that to satisfy my own personal demand. Collectively, you do have a point. But you so don't, do. you don't. You're, you're active, you told us you actively buy factory farmed products. Exactly, right. So you believe in a moral framework that you don't follow? Is that no, I follow my moral framework to the dot. Uh, it's the vegans that really don't follow their moral framework. Because I but can you just said it's possible for dairy to be acquired a different way, but you choose to buy the dairy that isn't acquired in that way. Because the harm is attributable to the industry, and I'm not convinced it's attributable to the consumer. Because it's not intrinsic. And if it's not intrinsic, then my yeah. demand... Uh, yeah, again, I just, I, I, I think you're being intellectually dishonest on this no, point. No, it's like, I just don't see it. If you say, if you say I drop a quarter, How do you not see it, Philip? How do you not see it? Cows have to be pregnant to produce yeah, milk, to make cheese. Yeah, but it's not intrinsic. That it is intrinsic. Okay, let's say, let's say I have um, uh, two cows in, in my backyard, right? And you then don't have two cows in your backyard. You I go know, to the but that, That's the whole point. Cheese. It's not intrinsic. I, because it can be another way, it's not intrinsic. It isn't another way. It isn't. But it can be. But it, it isn't. isn't. You pay oh for factory God. farm dairy. But then that's the point, right? I, I don't care about if it can be or not. I'm talking about there is harm, right? And you have to show who is accountable for that harm. And if it's not intrinsic, I don't see how it's accountable to me. It's kind of like saying I drop a quarter and therefore I'm responsible for some girl getting raped in Detroit, right? I, there's a leap there. No, dropping just, a quarter has nothing to do with a woman being raped. I, now, agree, if you said I, you don't, see, I don't see my demand with milk and eggs have anything to do with putting chicks down a blender. Well, if, I t if you were buying human breast milk, would you recognize that humans would need to be forcefully impregnated to get that breast milk if they didn't want to give it to you on their own accord? Well, it depends because in the, uh, if you assume like humans are being factory farms, they can express, if they do express negative uh, emotion and discomfort. Animals and, express negative emotion all the time. Yeah, they cry out in pain. For, uh, for other industrial practices that is not entailed with my demand. If I if I milk a cow in the I'm, uh, I live um, a bunch of near uh, a bunch of different farms. If I milk a cow, they don't care. If a chicken lays an egg, I pick it up. It doesn't care. It's not about whether the <laughs> yes cows. Well, first of all, I don't know how you're determining that this cow doesn't care that you're stealing the milk that was because meant it does for not baby. express any negative um, emotion to me. When you separate a baby cow from a mother, there's a whole lot of emotion being expressed. Separating a baby cow from its mother is not entailed with my demand. How are you supposed to get the breast milk <laughs> if you let the baby drink it? How you get breast milk is you take your hands on an udder and you squeeze. That's how you get breast milk. But what if the if the baby cow drinks the milk that you want, then you would have baby milk. Cow drinking uh, the milk is not entailed with my demand. I, I don't know where we can go from here, Philip, because in order, to, in order to produce milk, you have to be pregnant. And when you are pregnant, you have a baby and that baby is meant for that milk. So it seems like you're just ignoring the reality of the dairy industry because you like the taste of cheese or something. I mean, I can say the same thing about vegans. I can say, oh, you're ignoring about cotton field deaths because you like new T-shirts. We're not ignoring those deaths. We're, we're granting those deaths. 
So you're saying, so you are saying that it's morally obligatory to abstain from buying new clothing when you don't need to. No. <laughs> then <laughs> I don't know what to say, Brian. I mean, I love you guys. I think vegans are great. I think uh, it is virtuous to be vegan, but when when you when you do this when you play this game about it's not when you're like these harms are okay and these harms are not and you don't have any fully grounding with that it's just very unconvincing because you're refusing to accept that the harm and exploitation that you cause is direct in order to get eggs from a chicken in order to get milk from a cow there is direct exploitation involved in that there is in also order to direct harm with uh, cotton that's Those indirect. pesticides are direct. Those pesticides That's are indirect. direct. They're, they're meant to kill. I want to hear from Brian and Anna if they want to respond, and then we'll hear one last time from Professor, and then after that we'll go into the Q&A. No, I'm good. I think we should move on. Yeah, I'm honestly a little bit surprised because I think uh, this is the first time we've been presented with this uh, situation. It's, all, it's common knowledge even among non-vegans that – cows are exploited for milk and dairy. I mean, and milk and, uh, and chickens are exploited for eggs. So uh, I'm not sure where to go from here. Let's move on. Professor, do you I, have any um, last? Oh, that's right. Yeah, I, I, have a, you, I know you also wanted closing statements. Um, that's which, fine. I don't, I don't care. Okay. Well, we'll give you a chance mm -hmm. if you had something on your mind. Yeah, because I wanted to ask another uh, sort of a, a two-part question. Um, it sounds like you caught my debate with uh, vegan gains. Um, so how would you answer the question I posed to him of eradicating rodent infestations? Are you guys okay with that? Like if you had a, if you had a bunch of mice in your house, would you be okay? Would you call it um, necessary to eradicate them? Uh, oh, like you're saying if you had a... Uh, if you had a bunch of mice living in your house. Oh. If somebody, not you guys, let's say somebody had a bunch of mice living in their house and they wanted to get rid of them. And the only way to do it, they try every possible method to get rid of them humanely, but the only way they can do it is to kill them. Is it morally justified for them to do that? I think if you're worried about, you know, the mice giving you a disease or harming you, you know, like biting you, biting your companion animals, um, spreading disease, eating your food, like if you want them out of your home, I think that that's okay because there is no way to like negotiate with them. Obviously, like you said, like we would try every other more humane method to handle it. Well, we right, so you, you, killing them is also not a, uh, the best yeah, can, way to eradicate you them. You can also trap them and get rid of them. I mean, right. I'm saying you, you exhaust you exhaust every option. The only option left to you is like to poison them all to death. Um, so I guess what you're saying is in that situation, it's that's what it takes. That's what it takes. And I fully agree with you. But I guess I just want to point something out, which is that um, you know, rats, rats and cows are not that dissimilar in sentience. Rats are actually incredibly smart animals. They're very small, but they're very smart. Uh, mm -hmm. And I guess what you can say is that hopefully this sort of points out why you might get a lot of pushback from omnivores like me who perceive hy hypocrisy in that because a single cow can yield four to 500 pounds of meat, right? Uh, you know, normal, a large serving of meat is eight ounces. That's about a thousand meals. So one sentient being with the sentience of a, of a mouse um, can yield a thousand meals, and and you're not okay with that, but you are okay with, if necessary, eradicating tens of mice to get rid of an infestation in your house. Necessity and, is the yeah, key word. Because it's not necessary for you to eat cows. Well, it's not necessary for you to get rid of mice either. I mean, yeah, in theory they can give you diseases and things, but in reality that almost never happens. I mean, we live in a house that's uh, you know near a large field, and we have tons of mice. And, uh, you know, we're still, we're fine. And, and you can actually look at the statistics that they can carry disease, but it's not absolutely necessary to kill them all. It's more a question of want so than, than necessary. Yeah. I mean, if it's not necessary to kill them, then we wouldn't. But <clears throat> if it is, then it so is. people but have to accept rodent infestations in their house. No. You have you would have to present me with like a snakes on a plane situation where it's like <laughs> I see mice on the walls. But, but I, I mean, I don't see that being... Okay. <laughs> It's like you're talking to two people who remove ants and spiders and and very, crickets from our house very so. gently <laughs> in in glass you know I, I just I don't know what that has to do with like you said like eating cows because no, I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to be wrong but. I'm just trying to clarify you know what, what does your ideology lead to and um, you know it leads to a lot of things and one of them is that you might have to accept living with a rodent infestation in your house and um, well it, I mean just, I think important for people to recognize. 
I don't think that we would accept it. Like we always move things over to the human context or the, you know, if it's a pig, move it to a dog context. So like if 12 human beings just came into our house and we're like, we live here now, we're going to live here now. We would want them removed from our house as well. So well, of course, we're fine with it children. in the human context and we're fine with it in the mouse context. But you had to remove them by killing them. That was the only way to remove them. You think it's, it's acceptable. If they're threatening our lives. Maybe. No, they're not threatening their lives. They're just squatting. The mouse, the mice are just living there, right? I, I, I think you're cre you're sort of creating a scenario that's sort of self fulfilling. Like, if we need to kill them to remove them, then we will kill them to remove them. But it, that's because we need to. So it's, no, you don't need to remove them. You could just exist with them. Yeah, I don't. I don't or remove <laughs> the source. Remove the thing that is attracting them. I mean, why not? The thing is, it, it isn't. It isn't that. I don't think exhausting all possibilities is possible because it is possible to remove what is attracting them to your house. Not in my house. <laughs> I mean, you. You probably. Where do you live in the countryside? Well, I mean, again, it's it not. It just seems like a. It's not a, a thing that we are presented with on a daily basis for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Yeah. Most of the world, I mean, much of the world has a choice to make every time they sit down to eat. It is the one thing we do consistently every single day that we know for sure we are going to do if we have the privilege to eat food. Um, hopefully, uh, we can make a choice as to what we put at the other end of the fork. And, and that is what we mean by possible and practicable. It's like if you, if you have options that do not require to kill a sentient being, then why not go for those options? Well, because I disagree with you. This might be an opportunity to jump into the Q&A. Want to say thank you everybody for your super chats as 100% of the super chats from today's debate will be going to save the children as they are focused on helping feed and provide clean water for and education for children across the globe that are impoverished. And so we really believe in this charity. By the way, this charity is highly rated by the Charity Watchdog, Charity Navigator. We're always really picky about what we, in terms of what we do our monthly charity stream for. And so that's linked in the description if you want to see that Charity Watchdog evaluation. And also, you guys, our guests are linked in the description, so check out our guest links. And here is the first question. Nero, thanks for your donation to the charity. Appreciate it. No question attached. Let me know if you have one. Flat Earth Guy, thanks for your... Uh, this is a uh, wrong topic, but love this channel. That's right. He loves Flat Earth debates. We'll get you here, Brian and Anna, for a, a Flat Earth debate sometime. But yes, Paradigm, Paradigm Shift Music, thanks for your question, says 75 billion land animals eat way more plant food than 8 billion humans ever could. So the crop's death, though, quote-unquote, argument is lame. Vegan equals most moral. Uh, yeah, I guess that's for me. Well, uh, that's a two-quote quote fallacy. You can say that, oh, because meat eaters cause more, therefore I can cause um, just uh, I can cause harm as well. The fact of the matter is, you can minimize your calories. Everyone can cut at five hundred thousand calories. The bodybuilder can cut a bunch of calories and reduce crop deaths. Right? We do need crops, but we don't need the amount of land that we have for crops. If everybody reduces their calories, the crop land wouldn't be as big. And um, and crop deaths wouldn't uh, be as occurring, right? So to say that oh, because meat eaters cause more harm, therefore I'm justified in causing my unnecessary harm. The, by the vegan reasoning, that's inconsistent. Nikolai, thanks for your question. Says without the term obligatory, would you concede that a vegan diet is generally the most ethical mode of consumption in 2021? This is a question for everyone. Yes, I would say that being a vegan is uh, really virtuous, and I commend people for being vegan. Um, I just don't think it's uh, obligatory. I think the definition of ethical is based on the standards of the culture, uh, and beyond that, it's personal preference. And since our culture allows non-vegans and finds that ethical, there's really no difference. Uh, no one is, is quote-unquote, more ethical than the other. They're simply different uh, states of, of morality. Any thoughts, Brian and Anna? Uh, yeah, I mean, assuming that you're you care about sentience and you care about not exploiting fellow Earthlings, then yes, a, a vegan lifestyle is the most moral. 
Got you. And NOXD says, I don't eat animal products. It's a no-brainer, but things like pig heart valves save human lives. LCD screens, batteries, cars, etc. require animal products. Do you use those? It's animal exploitation. Well, as, again, as far as is possible and practicable, practicable, our drywall contains animal products. You know, we, we must live in a house and it, you know, in this particular uh, neighborhood, it, there must be drywall in, in the house. So um, we try to minimize harm as far as is possible and practicable. But in as far as our food consumption goes, we hope to eventually eliminate harm uh, completely someday, maybe. You got it. And thanks for your question. Will Stewart says, what moral authority do the vegans hold to? Uh, otherwise, maybe asking, like, what's your ethical theory? What moral authority? Oh, so well, I, I, they might also be. So I know that Will is a, a theist. So mm -hmm. he might also be mm -hmm. saying, like, whose morality says he's, a, he's basically that. implying that he, he thinks morality is objective or dictated by religion, which um, it, it doesn't have to be. I, I mean, I don't even understand how religious morally, morality is objective. I mean, I, I think morality is just subjective, full stop. But what we uh, care about is sentience because sentient beings are capable of experiencing pain and joy so we care about maximizing their joy and minimizing their pain gotcha and thank you very much for your question this one coming in from ezekiel hufton let me know if i pronounced it right it says if a cow falls uh let's see i i can't tell if they i think they're being sincere like if a call if a cow dies of natural causes is it ethical to eat it i think that's for me um yeah, well, what he's talking about, uh, given uh, what I had said in my opening statement, is that in, give, in a given market under given circumstances, right? So when you have a live cow, in order to procure its meat from it, it is necessary to harm it. Um, if you're talking about a cow like a thousand years from now that doesn't feel pain and regenerates its limbs every two seconds, then you're talking about a different thing. And if you're talking about um, roadkill or like a dead cow, then you are also talking about a different thing. I'm talking about in given circumstances as it is in reality with live animals, it is necessary to procure it. So if you do eat like live, um, like roadkill or anything like that, um, I wouldn't necessarily see a problem with that. You got it. And thank you very much for your question. This is a mouthful. So bear with me. Mm. The Crawdaddy 029 says, consuming meat has nothing to do with how said meat was obtained. If vegans have a problem with the treatment of livestock, targeting the consumer is the wrong direction to take. For all you know, the consumer eats roadkill or a Wonka vision type deal. Like when the candy bar was materialized in Willy Wonka? I guess that must be it. <laughs> For all we know, uh, 75, again, the, the number was actually said earlier by one of uh, your commenters, but uh, 75 billion animals are killed every single year. Those are just land animals. That's just land animals. Uh, fish are counted in tons, not numbers. So we, I think it is safe to assume, these are slaughterhouse numbers, it is safe to assume that most people are not eating roadkill. Yeah. He, he seems to be doing, he's, he seems to be quoting Matt Dillahunty there where he's saying like, the act of eating meat isn't necessarily immoral. We're not talking about the act of eating meat. We're talking about the act of paying for meat at a grocery store, which requires animals to be killed for that meat. You got it. And thanks for your question from Alan Green, who says the vast majority of animals are killed for food, not for drugs. Killing animals for drugs is wrong, but killing animals for taste is much worse. I think that might be for you, Professor. Yeah. Um, I mean, I guess uh, what you call worse is, is a matter of subject subjective opinion, but if you acknowledge that it's necessary to exploit animals to develop drugs and do research, you know, who are you to say that somebody can't feel that it's necessary for them to consume them? Gotcha. And thank you very much for your question. NOXD says it's a human issue too, though. Health, pollution, resources, tax money used as subsidies, Animal waste dumped in poor communities, exploiting humans for labor, etc. Isn't that enough to say it's immoral? That, I'd like to it? just make a comment to that. I'd like to make a comment on that. Um, uh, a flight to Europe from, from East Coast of America 
is about a uh, thousand kilograms of CO2 just for one flight. About an eight, a four ounce portion of chicken is about one kilogram. So um, if you truly think that animal agriculture is, is the only problem that we have, it's not, right? Um, in other words, one flight is equivalent in CO2 production to a thousand uh, meals of chicken. Gotcha. And Philip, do you have something to add? Yeah, I was I was gonna say, um, yeah, no, that is a problem, and is uh, I believe it's a collective obligation to address that. Um, but um, uh, that can you can lead to some um, weird scenarios where you can claim that um, global um, global warming is a much more dire threat than animal agriculture because it not only threatens the life presently but also all life in all futures. Um, so you can say that um, you cutting electricity use like lighting a candle and only having blankets around your house and also never driving a car those are moral obligations um as well which uh, i don't think a lot of people would want to admit to that you got to thanks for your question this one coming in from sideshow nav good to see you it says for the vegans is there a realistic vegan alternative to meet the nutritional needs of our society if so what is it there's no nutritional need for meat I mean, human beings can be perfectly healthy on plants alone. So I don't know why there needs to be a nutritionally equivalent meat. Meat's actually not that great for you. It has saturated fat and cholesterol. And I mean, it is a carcinogen. It, yeah. It's for the, uh... <laughs> for the World Health Organization. It causes like processed meat and red meat cause cancer. We know this. So I don't, veganism is not about nutrition. But to answer the question, there is no nutritional requirement for meat for a homo sapien we're primates like we can live on plants just fine gotcha and i'd like to i'd like to make a quick comment on that um, i more or less agree with you although you know, as a scientist i have to say i study very complicated systems you know like humans for example and um, one of the things that you, you learn over time from doing that is that you have to have a, a lot of humility in what you believe you know uh, because you're often proven wrong as science advances we learn all the things we didn't know and i think um you know some people are going to be uncomfortable with that and having a diet, you know, adopting a diet that many perceive to be just not the natural human diet, I think there is some degree of, uh, of validity to that concern. I mean, I think all the science that we have indicates that a vegan diet is a perfectly healthy diet, probably a more healthy diet on average. But at the same time, we do know that you need to supplement, right? Which is an indicator. Um, maybe we know everything we know we need to know about supplements, and maybe supplementing for B12 is, is all you need to do. But then again, maybe you don't. And I think different people are going to have different tolerances for that kind of risk going forward. 30 percent 30 percent of the world population is deficient in b12 so that's not necessarily a vegan problem um it's uh supplement aisles were a thing before veganism like really took hold in our society so i don't see anything wrong with supplementing when we need to like some people need to supplement vitamin d if they don't live in areas that are uh very sun you know if they live in areas where the sun doesn't shine or they stay much. indoors all the time. Yeah. Like the reason people need to supplement is because we live unnatural lives. So claiming that you need a natural diet in an unnatural life is kind of contradictory. Well, I don't know about that, but I would definitely say that um, you know, I think sup I think supplementing with B12 is probably enough, but you know, I hope that's true. I, I, as a scientist, I can't say for sure that it is. Uh, yeah, I mean, the, the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics thinks otherwise, and that's the largest body of health professionals on the planet. Not so. necessarily <laughs> vegan either. Right, and that's They're why I agree vegan, with you. Yeah. I'm just saying that don't discount other people's fear, right? Um, but their many fear people is are just Their fear is unwarranted. The, the professionals have weighed in. Right, and hopefully they're right. They've never been wrong before, right? We will jump into the next question. Let's see. If you guys would like a chance to respond to that, Brian and Anna, I do, because the Super Chat was targeting you. I want to give you the last word if you have one. Uh, I mean, that that's it. Like, I, I mean, the reason why we've we've specialized as a society is like, I don't, I'm not a plumber and that's okay because I can bring a plumber into my home to fix my plumbing issues. So I don't need to be a health professional because health professionals exist. So I trust their opinion more than my own because I am not a health professional. And to my knowledge, which is their knowledge, you don't need me to be healthy at all. And I feel like that's pretty well documented. Even the professor says that you can be perfectly healthy on a vegan diet. This one comes say in I'm from... pretty sure that's true. Okay. Kalub, good to hear your uh, question. It, basically, this is interesting. He says, I know a lady who raises chickens and treats them like her kids. They live happy lives and die naturally. But she also eats their eggs. 
is that wrong as they so i guess they just naturally you know when they happen to have eggs she eats them but she doesn't mm -hmm. you could well, say like pressure the process a chicken we have a chicken <laughs> we've had more than one chicken and we feed their eggs back to them uh, because well one they come out of their butt vagina i don't want to put anything in my mouth that comes out of a chicken's butt vagina um, to, uh, the particular hens that this woman has, uh, I don't know where she acquired them, rescued them, what have you, even if they were, um, so there's two, well, you can, <laughs> you can, you can do it because I'm going to well, go. Well, into usually, two well, directions. yeah, the, it's the backyard hens though, argument against veganism. Uh, if you buy chickens specifically for eggs in your backyard, you buy them from a hatchery and at that hatchery male chickens are killed because they're useless yet again it's an egg industry so males are useless they don't lay eggs um, furthermore it's simply exploitative to take something from an animal that doesn't belong to you it's it's her egg we're commodifying and, them yeah you're, you're treating the animal like a commodity and it takes a lot of calcium and iron and other minerals to produce the egg most chickens will die from reproductive illness uh, especially if they were brought up or bred into that industry. Yeah. So it's it. still exploitative, way better than buying eggs at a grocery store, but still exploitative. You got it. And thanks for your question. Sigma Any says, vegans, Brian and Anna, what would be your approach to convincing indigenous peoples of the Arctic that they shouldn't participate in substance hunting to feed their families over the winter? I don't know that we would try to convince them of that. I mean, if they live in the Arctic and they have no other choice but to eat animals, then I suppose they have to survive. But that's not an excuse for people living in the United States to go to McDonald's. Like, it's a weird fringe argument that has nothing really to do with the practicable and possible part of the definition of veganism. We, I mean, we would hope, like, we wish it were possible that they that they could live a life without harming animals. But again, like it just goes back to the word needless versus need. If you need to do it, then you need to do it. But if it's needless, it's needless. Gotcha. And thanks for your question. Alan Green says, Professor, just because society thinks something is moral, it doesn't make it moral. Slavery is wrong, even if most of society used to think otherwise. Mm -hmm. I mean, I guess um, I don't think you understood my argument, but I think the definition of moral is whether your society thinks it's moral. It doesn't mean that all societies will think it's moral or that all future societies will think it moral, right? Clearly in, in the case of slavery, it was once considered moral and now we consider it immoral. Gotcha. And this one coming in from the Crawdaddy 029 says saying a pig is food and a dog is not is terrible counter to not being angry at the pig being kicked. I would be equally angry about both. However, I will also eat both pig and dog as I am omnivore. So I think they're challenging. Do I interpret this right? I think that's this is... for me. Yeah. Um, yeah, I was asked that directly. Yeah, I mean, I guess uh, what I would say is that um, kicking, a, kicking a dog is not fundamentally like universally immoral because there is no objective morality. The reason it feels bad is because we are conditioned in a culture where kicking dogs is wrong. The reason it feels fine for most people living in our society to eat pigs is because we are conditioned by our culture to think it's, it's moral. It's fine. So uh, how you feel about an act doesn't determine whether it's moral or not. For that, you need to consult the moral standards of your culture. Gotcha. And thank you very much for your question. This one coming in from Pax Americana. Oh, it says just a hello. Hi, James. Oh, hope all is well. Thanks to you too, buddy. And then Crawdaddy029. Will Stewart says, Vegans, if your moral authority is not objective, then it is illogical and unreasonable to claim moral obligation. By what authority do you claim that there is obligation? Without authority, are you not left with only opinion or subjectivity? Yeah, I mean, morality is sort of similar to preference. I mean, morality is kind of two-pronged. It, it's Morality is the idea that there are right and wrong acts that exist, and also we ought to do what's right and we oughtn't do what's wrong. That's kind of what morality is. Um, but just saying that if morality isn't objective, it's useless, that's not proof of objective morality. 
uh, and that doesn't disprove subjective morality. You can still have a subjective moral framework that works just fine. It doesn't need to be objective. Gotcha. I mean, I think he's claiming that uh, for it to be obligatory, meaning can you compel another in your society to adopt your morality if they don't agree with you? I think you can't compel another, right? Well, if you we, believe morality is subjective, then it's your opinion. And if somebody has a different moral code, like I do, it's their opinion. And you, neither of us can compel the other to adopt our morality unless there is some higher authority. Or if you could show that we actually have the same morality and one of us is ignorant, right? Like, for example, I actually think that I should absolutely minimize exploitation to animals. And I haven't realized that. And your job is to educate me to that fact. And then maybe I actually should be vegan, right? I don't actually believe that. But um, there's no other way to compel somebody to adopt your morality. Well, there is because we were compelled. Yeah, I mean, I mean, we, I grew up in Costa Rica, heavy, you know, not super heavy, not as other South American countries were mostly plant based, but there's still some heavy consumption, uh, especially now with the fast food popping up everywhere. Um, yeah. But I, you know, I was convinced by who, who convinced, oh, Earthlings, I mean, watching the documentary Earthlings at, at the age of 25, that's uh, when I decided to make a change. It's the and, distinction and, between compulsion and, and convincing. You can convince, but you can't compel. I want to give uh, Brian and Anna the last word before we go into the next question. Uh, it, well, it sounds like you're using the, the word compel, like force them to change or whatever. I mean, I can't. we can't force anyone to do anything. All we can do is yeah. point out inconsistencies in a person's existing moral framework, like they care about dogs, they don't care about pigs. Why? Or they care about humans, they don't care about animals. Why? We can point out the reasons why you should care about animals, and they're virtually the same reasons why you why you already care about other animals or humans. But no, we can't force anyone to go vegan. We're trying to convince people to change their hearts and minds. Next, yeah, I'm sorry. Um, oh, I'm sorry. If I just that, um, wait, it's uh, short just and pithy, quick... Philip. Yeah, sure, of course. Just a quick question. Um, then, uh, if there's no objective morality, why are inconsistencies bad then? because an inconsistent moral framework leads to bad outcomes for society. So you could devise a moral framework that's completely inconsistent. Like you're allowed to, you know, you're allowed to kill children, but not teenagers or something. It, it would just lead to horrible outcomes for a society. Dave asks, for Brian and Anna, why is it okay to wipe out animals that damage crops, but not okay to eat animals? What, what, crop, crop deaths though, crop again? Deaths? <laughs> I think we covered that. I mean, there is data. There is there's data. We haven't even touched on the data, but I'd have to find the uh, yeah the graphic. Um, the number of animal deaths per one million calories in eight food categories. Yeah. But uh, yeah, if you care about crop deaths, then then don't eat meat because most of the livestock you consume eats most of the crops that are grown on this earth. Juicy and supersonic fan says so. Philip, basically what you are saying is killing a cow or a chicken isn't a necessary process in order to get their milk or eggs. So anything else that happens to those animals are out of your control. I think they're um, trying to I don't know if it's out of I don't know if it's out of my control, but I just wouldn't find it um, I just don't see a reason why it's accountable to me. Um, if it's not intrinsic to my demand, like harm is, I, I don't believe, I know Anna and Brian disagree with me, but I personally don't believe that um, harm is necessary or intrinsic in my demand for someone to pick up an egg or milk a cow to send it to me. Therefore, um, the accountability actually lies in the person who actually does the harm rather than the consumer. Gotcha. And this question coming in from the Crawdaddy029 says, when I buy a phone or shoes, I'm not saying I support child labor. I'm filling my need and still griping about child labor i think they're trying to say that to you brian and anna like hey uh you know like if we are not supporting it namely child labor when we buy things that came from child labor uh then isn't it the case that we're not um supporting well, I yeah, I think again that goes that goes down to the intrinsic disagreement that Philip and we have, which is harm and exploitation is intrinsic to animal products. It's not intrinsic to non-animal products. Thank you. And then Daver says, vegans, why is it okay for you to exhale carbon dioxide contributing to climate change, but not okay for a cow to exhale carbon dioxide? We've never made that argument. 
we humans exhale carbon dioxide because that's how human biology works and cows exhale carbon dioxide or methane because that's how cow biology works you got it and the crawdaddy 029 strikes again he is ferocious tonight he says you don't have to live in a house mud hut for the win mud hut for the win dude yeah. <laughs> you want to live in a mud hut go for it <laughs> I think, oh, but, but I think they're, sorry, I didn't die. I, I, maybe you've already made the connection. If you did, forgive me. I'm not trying to, uh, but I think they're trying to allude to the idea of the yes, animal it's an, products. It's, sorry to interrupt, James. No, no, you're good. You got uh, it. it. It's an appeal. It's, it's another appeal to futility. Like you don't have to drive a car. You could ride a bike. You don't have to ride a bike. You could walk. You don't have to live in a house. You could live in a mud hut. You don't have to live in a mud hut. You could live in the woods. You don't have to exist. You could not exist. Like you can just keep going down that rabbit hole until, you know, eliminating all harm would just be not existing. You got it. And thank you very much for your question. This one coming in from Dave, who says, vegans, how does a slaughterhouse profit on the sole act of torturing slash harming animals? Uh, they kill them against their will. So that's how they harm them. That's how they profit off of harming them. They kill them as babies. I mean, pigs are six months old, chickens are six weeks old, cows are one year, two year old, and they're killed as babies because people want to eat their flesh. Uh, torture is kind of a, uh, yeah, it's kind of a, a slippery word. I mean, I, I would argue that cutting off a pig's tail without anesthesia, cutting out a pig's testicles without anesthesia, cutting off their teeth without anesthesia, that's torture. And the reason they do that is so that the pigs don't cannibalize and pick on each other because they're very intelligent animals. And when you can find them in a warehouse, they literally go insane, just like human beings would if you can find them in a prison cell. So yeah, there's direct harm involved in Slaughterhouse. Gotcha. Yeah. And, oh, this is interesting. Ghost Light asks, question for Brian and Anna, where do you draw the line between moral value and no moral value with animals? I think they're meaning, like, for example, like bacteria, you probably don't sweat. Um, but they're saying, like, what, like, maybe what's a general answer in terms of, like, where the boundary might be for, like, living organisms? Um, I think it would be sentience. Like, if we know a being is sentient, then we choose not to harm them. And, you know, as, if we can, if we can avoid it. So bacteria aren't sentient to our knowledge, just like carrots aren't sentient, but pigs are. So we try to um, maximize their joy and minimize their pain because they can experience joy and pain. Gotcha. And they, thank you very much for this question. This one coming from Tuss Beatbox, who says, if you have time for this, Professor, what is your, by the way, Tuss, thanks for all your support of the channel. Appreciate all your positivity. It says, Professor, what's your answer to name the trait? You should have a talk to ask yourself or Dr. Avi about it. What's your answer? Uh, yeah, I mean, I gave my answer in my previous debate. Um, uh, and I fully acknowledge it's totally arbitrary because I think morality is arbitrary. But essentially what I consider to be the trait is actually two traits. It's uh, uh, essentially a species or it's a species capable of reciprocating a social contract and uh, high sentience. I think where uh, kind of went off the, ra the rails with Richard uh, Vegan Gaines was he was trying to essentially argue it's a human but not a human by saying that you change the DNA slightly. And I, I responded that, um, you know, when we talk about an object like like a chair or a human, it's not defined by a single trait. It's, it's a, essentially a pattern match. What your brain does, like you've seen a lot of chairs. When you see a chair, you know what a chair is. Uh, you've seen a lot of humans. <laughs> when, you, when you see a human, you know what a human is. Uh, the other thing I, was, I wanted to point out, I didn't get time in that, was that um, modifying DNA slightly is not a well-defined term. There is no such thing as the human genome. There are many human genomes. We have unique genomes. So, um, you know, exactly how far do you modify it? And I tried to get into it, and he sort of just laughed. Um, <laughs> I don't think he wanted to discuss it anymore. Uh, but I guess, you know, yeah, I would say that um, when you encounter a moral gray area like that, you know, imagine that it's a human and not a human at the same time. And I don't have a great response to that because the reality is that I haven't been culturally conditioned to have an answer to that question. I've never seen a human not human before. I'd probably on the side of not eating it. Um, but uh, in general, you know, if I'm given a kind of a more reasonable uh, situation, I'd say if it's a really smart animal like a gorilla, you know, don't eat it, don't kill it. Um, and if it's a human, don't kill it. The pigs gotcha. are super smart. <laughs> and I mean, I disagree. I disagree with um, 
Fran and Anna on the sentience of other animals. I mean, didn't get to go there, but I think of sentience essentially as being uh, an emergent phenomenon that occurs in certain species. It only it has only occurred in my mind uh, in a handful of species. I would say high sentience. So I think there's there's levels of sentience, sentience and that uh, once intelligence and certain brain structures cross cross a threshold, essentially uh, what we think of human level consciousness turns on, and it's very it's an emergent phenomenon. So what this means is that below a certain level, there's very little going on in the brain. Animals essentially have no idea what's going on. They're living moment to moment, driven mostly by instinct. And that's why I don't feel so bad killing them. Gotcha. And we want to remind you folks that our guests are linked in the description. We want you to check out their links as we really do appreciate our guests. As always, we want to ask you to be your regular friendly selves as well here at Modern Day Debate or hey, at their links as well in attacking the arguments rather than the people. We really do appreciate our guests and so want to, as I mentioned, remind you that they are indeed linked below. And so we will, in just a moment, I will be back in a moment letting you know in the post credit scene of the debate, upcoming debates that we have coming up. So for example, at the bottom right of your screen, Destiny will be back this Friday against Brenton Langle. That should be a fun one. But one last thank you to our guests, as we really do appreciate you. It's been a true pleasure to have you, Brian, Anna, Professor, and Philip. Thank you, James. Thank you. So much. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you very much, everybody. It's Absolutely. so awesome that you provide this neutral platform, James, and we really appreciate the opportunity to get our message out there. So thank you. Thank you. That's super encouraging. That means more than you know. And so also, folks, want to remind you that the uh, we for accountability purposes, we always, and we now put it in the community tab on the YouTube channel, we put the donation uh, receipt. And so that'll be in the Google Drive folder so you can look at it, and it'll be on our community tab, though. So just so you know, we want you to be able to uh, see that. And so... Like I said, I'll be back in just a moment with that post credit scene. Thanks, everybody. And thank you. thanks one more time thanks, to our guests. Thanks, Professor. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Phil. Thank you, everybody.
folks, that was awesome. I really enjoyed that. I'm super encouraged. That was really fun. I, I just love our guests. Want to remind you, they're linked in the description. And yeah, I, we got to let you know, guys, I'm pumped about upcoming debates. For example, this one right here that you are seeing, that's going to be fun. Destiny's moral system, you could say, on trial. And so we're excited about that. That's this Friday, you guys. Tomorrow is going to be fun. A debate on whether or not Moses existed. So that should be interesting. And then, yeah, we've had a lot of, uh, it's been a lot of times. So when people come to us and they've already got like an opponent set up, um, especially if it's like a, you know, like a quality opponent, they're like, Hey, you know, I already, you know, I got Tom jump to agree, you know, can we come on? And I'm like, yeah, like we try to schedule it like really quick. Cause we really appreciate when people do that. It's like, Hey, that's awesome. Especially like tag team debates. Um, and so we have a lot in the next week we've got like, yeah, it's like a lot. So we've got a lot of debates coming up. I think we're trying to set up a one-on-one -on -one with Skylar Fiction and William Stewart on Monday. That should be a lot of fun. And then also, though, I'm excited because we are trying to set up, let's see, this Saturday, Maddox and Randolph. That should be an interesting one. So hopefully you tune in and don't miss that. That should be juicy. But yeah, you guys, I'm just pumped. I'm excited. And so thank you guys for all of your support. I am pumped about the future. You guys, it does mean a lot. And also, you guys, I'm pumped that everybody together, we are united no matter what walk of life we are from. You guys, I know you come from all sorts of different walks of life. People disagree on the topic even being debated tonight. And nonetheless, super excited that we had raised the money that we did tonight in this charity stream all together. That's something we all agree on is making the world a better place, such as basically giving to Save the Children, a great charity with a great rating, by the way, in terms of their accountability and how well they actually use their funds to help people. They do a fantastic job, and we together are united in wanting to make that cause, you could say, effective, to make the world a better place together, no matter what walk of life we're from. We're all in agreement on that, and thanks all of you who have pitched in for that. And thanks even just for being here. I want to let you know, if you buy into the vision of providing a nonpartisan platform so that people can make their case on a level playing field, if you believe in that vision, we appreciate your support. We are thankful you're here. And just by being here, you know, that supports the channel. And so I want to let you know there are a billion different ways to support the channel. One of them is just hanging out here. It makes it more fun, the more the merrier. And so we do appreciate you. And Human Girl, glad to see you in the chat. Shadow Starshine, thanks for being with us. Sideshow Nav, good to see you again, my friend. Likely a zombie, glad you're here. Tusk Beatbox, good to see you again. Argon the Sad, glad you're with us. TJB, thanks for that smile in the live chat. Appreciate that. Paradigm Shift Music says, thanks again for the excellent content as always. Thanks for that, friend. I appreciate that. That really does mean a lot. And Joey E, good to see you. And Duncono. Glad you're here. Stuck in Florida. Man, you're a longtime viewer. I, I remember seeing you here for a long time. So glad you're here. Glad you're back. I feel like it's been a while since I've seen you. Rut Rowena, thank you for being with us as well. Caleb, you know, my dear friend. Damien Stoy, glad you're here. And Urshman, thanks for being with us. As well as, as Sigma Any, thanks for hanging with us. Mashi M, glad you are here. And Nero, thanks for your kind words. Seriously, appreciate it. Fox Sushi, thanks for coming by, my friend. Good to see you. And Brooke Chavis, glad to see you as always. Thanks for your kind words, Brooke. Appreciate that support. And Alex Shannon, thanks for your kind words. Alex says, James, thank you for providing this platform. That seriously is encouraging. I do appreciate that more than you know. Sigma, and he says, thanks, James, and guests, and chat. I know I do a lot of poking and prodding in the chat, but many... Love, much love to everyone on both sides of the argument. Thanks for that. Appreciate that, my friend. And let's see. Sideshow Nav says, great debate while supporting a great cause. Thanks. I am excited. But yeah, you, you guys, for real, I'm just pumped that it's like, it gives me so much satisfaction. I know that it's like, we only do it once a month. And so, you know, it's, but it, nonetheless, when we do it, I, I do love when we get to do that, the charity stream together. And so thanks for your support on that. Sunday Worship, good to see you. Thanks for coming by. And yeah, I'm pumped though, you guys. I am really pumped about the future. And thanks everybody. As yesterday, we just hit 44,000 subscribers, which is encouraging. Thank you guys. You guys make this channel awesome.
Like you guys seriously rock. And so we do appreciate you. Ferris Alice, good to see you. Says caught this at the end again, but killed it again. James and Modern Day Debate team. Thanks for your support, my dear friends. And and Root says it's not Rowett, it's Root. Thanks for letting me know that, Root. And yeah, I am pumped. We are pumped, you guys. Uh, Nikolai says, let's get James to 50,000. We are pumped, you guys. Thanks for your support. That is one way you can support Modern Day Debate is just sharing the content for real. If you just share it on your social media, like Facebook or Twitter, or maybe you have a friend who you know loves debates, like they're like, oh, yeah, I listened to this and it, it's like, it's great. I would highly encourage, like that definitely does help us. We really do appreciate when you do that and that's a great way to support us so thanks for that and brooke chavis thanks for your support in the live chat that is a way actually i've got to say when you're in the live chat and you remind people to like and subscribe that definitely helps so seriously that i bet you a lot of people they probably like they're just kind of peeking in and they're like what's this like modern day debate like huh what's going on in here and they're just kind of like sitting in the chat and they're kind of trying to figure out what the channel is and they're kind of like, yeah, I kind of like this. And then if they see somebody in the chat who's like, hey, hit that subscribe button, like it's probably a reminder. They're like, oh, yeah, yeah, sure. I'll, I'll, I'll hit that subscribe button. You know, maybe I'll come back and you'll know, see what else they've got coming out. And so that really, I think that does help. And so it's kind of like they always say that um, it's like, I think they say that it's like seven times. Oftentimes you have to hear a message multiple times to either one, like notice it or two, maybe just for it to click or, you know, whatever it is. And so I think that helps. And so Huckleberry Sin says, modern debate, modern day debate, loved it. Didn't even realize it was a charity stream. You guys are the best. Thanks for your kind words, my friend. Seriously, that is encouraging. And so we're excited. You guys, uh, we have two goals, broadly speaking, to make the world a better place than before you could say, uh, than, than the way we found compared to how we found it. You could say, um, namely, Better than if we had never been here. That's the way we, we do want to have that impact on the world. I think that's something we'd all agree on too. Whether you be atheist, Christian, Muslim, agnostic, you know, and you name it, vegan, non-vegan, we are confident you'd agree in valuing that. And also the vision of providing a neutral platform so people can make their case on a level playing field. That's something we value and we are excited about it. And we really do have big aspirations, you guys. Like we are absolutely I am like determined and we're going to learn and just keep growing and learning and figuring out how can we keep doing uh, better? How can we keep learning and, and providing a better show and better debates? And so we are working on that and we are confident it's just going to keep getting better. And so we appreciate all of your support. We honestly can't thank you enough and we are excited about that future. And so let's see. Sideshow and F says, and over 100 likes tonight, rock on. Oh, that's great. If we got 100 likes during the stream already, that's excellent. 103, that's cool. And let's see. RFFEFCE says, you made it to 44,000. We did. We're excited about that. We appreciate everybody's support. Seriously. It's seriously exciting about the future, you guys. And we couldn't thank you enough. You guys make it fun here. You make it awesome. And so we really do appreciate it. And so let's see, Brooke, thanks so much. You're right. Brooke says, don't forget to check out the Twitch chat. That's true. You guys, we do have a Twitch account. And so let me link that. Oh, you're right. Beastical, thanks for being with us. Top cell, top, top bot cell. Thanks so much for your support. Seriously, as we have these emotes now. The emotes in Twitch are awesome, and so we appreciate it. If you're watching via Twitch, I want to encourage you to consider, highly encourage you to consider following us on Twitch. And it's like, hey, we are always most, uh, let's see, we are trying to make it more consistent on Twitch. As I, I think I had heard that sometimes when Praise, I think it's because Praise uses StreamYards. Um, sometimes it doesn't, what's the word I'm looking for? Sometimes it doesn't go on to Twitch. And so we're working on that. And so thanks for that. And so, but yeah, we totally appreciate you guys. Thanks so much. Brooke Sparrow, Beastical, Poor Lucy, everybody in the Twitch chat. We appreciate you just scrolling through here, getting to see everybody. And yeah, I love those emotes. Those are super cool. Red Ashitaka. Am I pronouncing it right? Let me know. 
Thanks for being here with us. Lozenge, thanks for being with us. Says cheers, folks. But yeah, you guys, I uh, I'm just pumped about the future. We've got a lot of big plans, and I've got to say, yeah, we are pumped. I also the 40 year old vegan. Thanks for being with us, my friend. We're glad you're with us. And I also forgot if you didn't know this, we are pumped, you guys. Namely, uh, this has been something that I really enjoy because. I've been like super encouraged a lot of people in the last like month um, and surprised because I'm like, oh, well, that's like super encouraging. Uh, a lot of been a lot of people have been signing up for our Patreon. And so I just put the Patreon link in the live chat. And so if you get a kick, if you like Patreon or you get a kick out of it, I encourage you to check it out. We've got three tiers in Patreon and... One of them, for example, you can see on the bottom right, or I should say the bottom of your screen, see this little ticker? Chris Gammon right there. See his name? It's moving. So That is one of the perks in the Patreon is we have our thank, thank you to all of our patrons in that bottom scroll on screen. And then we also have stuff like our uh, monthly Patreon meeting, which is kind of people just giving input on like new directions for the channel, all that good stuff. And we appreciate that. And so, yeah, we are excited about the future though. We appreciate you guys so much for all of your support. And thank you, Paradigm Shift Music, who says, I would pay good money to see Dr. Avi and ask yourself debate professor. Oh, that'd be fun. I'll try to set that up. I'll see if he wants to do it. That would be really fun. And so Dencono says the 40-year-old vegan subbed. Thanks. Totally appreciate that, the 40-year-old vegan. Thanks for subbing. And, yeah, I'm just excited, though, you guys. Tell me how your lives are going. I just like kind of like getting to hear from you and just reading through the chat, hanging out with you guys. And Shadow Star, Shadow Starshine, I don't know if we've seen you here a lot. We hope you feel welcome. Glad you're here with us. But yeah, I can reach out to Dr. Avi and ask yourself, do you mean like a two-on-one debate or maybe like a, how about, could it work if it was like maybe professor and maybe even like a rematch to, well, roughly speaking, like professor and uh, Philip against Dr. Avi and ask yourself, that could work. Like I'm open to it, but yeah, this one, you guys, I, I miss Steven. I know, here's the thing. I got to tell you, I know not everybody agrees with all the different people we have on modern day debate, and that's normal. You can't agree with everybody, and that's okay. You can still be friends with them. Um, and so, but I, I just, I get a kick out of Steven. I just, like, I think Steven Destiny is such, I just, he's got an easygoing, just kind of like chill demeanor that it just like makes me, I just like it. I love it. It makes me kind of like laugh, and not in like a mean way, but like a way of just like, <laughs> There's just something that's so chill about Destiny that is just so even keeled. And also, I don't know if I had ever told you guys this story. When Vosh and Destiny debated in person and when we hosted it in Los Angeles, it was a, a really fun debate. Um, we, the Wi-Fi in the building that we were in, didn't work. It, it like gave out and it started getting rough and patchy and we couldn't support a stream. The entire debate was using Destiny's uh, data from his phone so we could have that debate. And Steven's like, yeah, sure, I'll try. And he set it up and we were like, oh man, thank you so much. So that he saved the day. Test Beatbox says either or preferably, I think it would be great one-on-one, -on -one, maybe time for Avi to make his first MDD appearance from what I know. That's true. And I, I honestly would love to have Dr. Avi and I, I feel like I've, he's a busy man, of course. And so that's like kind of the the only reason we haven't gotten him on it is that, um, but I know that we can find a way. Cause he told me, I think he said Saturdays usually work and I, I just have been behind. And so let me reach out to him and we'll try to get him to come on. Cause that'd be a lot of fun. Brooke Chavis. Let's see. Paradigm music, paradigm shift music says, yeah, two V two would be amazing. And everyone would appreciate it. Yeah, that would be cool. And Brooke Chavis says, I just signed up for Patreon yesterday. Modern day, day debate is is my name going to be on the patron list on the screen? Oh, you're right, Brooke. I'm so sorry. Thank you so much, Brooke, for becoming a patron. And you were 100% right. And so let me let me fix this right now because um, I can do it right now. And so 
I just appreciate it. Let me go to Patreon scroll and then Patreon patrons, including Brooke, Cha Chavis, Chavis. Let me know if I'm pronouncing right or wrong. I know you've corrected. You've told you've told me how to pronounce it before, so I'm sorry. But let me see if I can re. I'm gonna. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna change this over. So what I'm gonna do is first I'm gonna switch here, Big James, and then I'm coming back, and it should start the Patreon scroll at the start. No, it's not. Okay, let me see. Is it, we're gonna have to get to the top, like the front of the list again, um, Brooke, for it to show. Sorry about that, but it, thanks for reminding me. And then let's see. I saw someone say something about the possible debate. Ryan Stevens says, "Darth versus Leo, make it happen." Check out their recent talk. That's funny. Um, Paradigm Music Shift said, "Two v two would be amazing." And Root says, can we start a Patreon for me and my kids? I have a 50 euro a week. I don't get it. You 50 euro a week, like Patreon? Or that's how much it costs to like feed your kids? I'm confused. But George VN, thanks for being here, says Destiny is cool. L says, that's a girl's name. The, it was like a, I, the funniest debate maybe ever was Jesse Lee Peterson against Destiny. That was a super funny one. And so, yeah. But yeah, let's see. Where is it? I have to update. I'm so sorry. Let me find here. Thanks, Paradigm Shift Music says, hoping for the best. Thank you very much for all your efforts. I certainly hope to support you all with Patreon eventually. Thanks for that support. Seriously, it means a lot. And Brian Steven says, Darth vs. Leon uh, I don't know if that's going to happen. Try it. Ninja, Invisible Ninja, thanks for being with us. A great debate while you're working. I'll take that wrench-looking sword. Yeah, I can dig that. And also want to let you know, Invisible Ninja, I responded to you in, in the Patreon messages, just so you know. And Brooke, I responded to you too. No joke. I'm not making this up. I, I could have sworn I responded either this morning or yesterday. Or I, I was say not responded, but I reached out to you via Patreon messages. And so thanks so much for your support, Brooke, for real. And I'm also going to quick update the chat because I am a little, you're right, I'm behind. Oh, and yeah, Invisible Ninja, I actually messaged you as well. R-F-F-F-E-F-C-E -E says, is there any chance of getting Ray Comfort back? There is somewhat of a chance. I think that our, our new Kickstarter strategy could work. Um, I think it's a possibility. So we are right now, I'm trying to set up a Kickstarter event with hopefully Richard Carrier against either Jeff Durbin or um, I'm trying to remember who else. Maybe James White. I don't know. And so that could be epic. Uh, that's something that's kind of like in the works. I think that I'm trying to remember if Richard Carrier and James White debated before, but that could be fun. So we are excited about that. Root says, dude, that's, that wasn't something to shout out. Ha ha. Anyway, yeah, when all the bills are paid, you're, oh, sorry. I didn't mean to shout out anything private. Sorry, man. Um, or or ma'am. But yeah, I'm... Uh, Pardon me. I'm just like reading the, I don't always like process. Nero says you could do elephant philosophy versus T jump. I don't know who elephant philosophy is or new to me. I've got to check them out. Brooke, thanks for sending a message back. I will check it quickly, shortly. Right now I'm having trouble getting my email to load, but I feel like I've heard of elephant philosophy. Isn't someone like kind of famous on YouTube? But, whew. Two seconds. So many burps, you guys. All my seltzer water. Nobody has more seltzer water than me. Believe me. And it's 8.38 already. That means, I think, oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, Hunter, my boy. And um. Did I already? 
Mm -mm -mm. Uh, let's see. There it is. Scroll. Two seconds. I'm updating something. Gerard. And Lewis Barnett. So, absolutely, Brooke, thank you for becoming a new patron, as well as Sideshow Nav and Lewis Barnett and Gerard O'Reilly. Want to say huge thanks for becoming new patrons. And Invisible Ninja, thank you as well. And so, thank you guys for, re for real, for your, all of your support. It means a lot. And I've also, wait a minute, let me check on this. Invisible Ninja, Sideshow Nav. But yeah, we are pumped about the future. In particular, I am super excited about hopefully an epic Kickstarter next month. So we're working on making that happen. I assume a lot of people are really busy. Um, because it's just been kind of slower responses and I'm just kind of like, huh, I wonder what they're up to. But I know that people have got a lot of projects and stuff like that. So thanks Brooke for sending that message back and nuns of your business. We are glad you are here, my friend. And s let's see. Anybody that I missed, Skeptic77, good to see you. Glad you made it. Luis Miguel, thanks for being with us and glad you made it. But yeah, pumped. Thanks, guys. I love you guys. Thanks for all your support. Seriously, I'm excited about the future. I'm encouraged. And we are just going to keep, it's going to keep getting more epic, you guys, all the time. It's just going to keep getting better. So thanks, everybody. Keep sifting out the reasonable from the unreasonable and excited as it's either, it's probably going to be Converse moderating tonight on whether or not Moses was a hoax and then I'll be back Friday for this debate with Destiny and Brenton. And I'll be back Saturday night as well. And so thanks, everybody, for all your love and support. Appreciate you guys. Love you. And have a great rest of your night or day, depending on where you are.